Donc, first la première session, avec Jérôme Bouba, le francilien, qui va nous parler de l'impact du French Program, sur le développement du software stack pour les existants. Merci Christophe. Donc, je suis Jean-Pierre Villot. Jean-Pierre est en fait de Great Britain, Here is a substitute for, for Jean-Pierre. So I will be working about the NUPEX program, and as I have said, it's a, a French program that is that we focus on the development of the, of the software stack for the exascaline um, uh, as a contribution for a European exascaline and, and a French exascaline as well. So I will give more details about NUPEX, but basically it's directed by three people, so Jean-Luc Bertou from INRIA, uh, Mikhail Trajaki from CNRS, and myself from CA. And it's decomposed into different projects that I will describe a bit later. And these projects uh, uh, involve uh, almost all the HPC uh, community uh, in, in France, from universities to uh, CNRS, INRIA, and engineering schools. So, what's at stake? So, uh, basically, as you all know, uh, the Exascale will be a new paradigm for, HP, for HPC that will be at the center of uh, um, uh, solutions to answer to quick questions uh, in science, where, whether it's related to climate change, to astrophysics. This morning, with Exa, we mentioned uh, fusion, uh, so it's very important for science. But it's also very important for the industry, uh, leading to uh, um, important breakthroughs uh, in engineering, such as transportation, aeronautics, uh, and also uh, energy production and, and transport. So it's very, very important with a huge impact on society. So what's at stake? Uh, exascale is just not a number of 10 to the power of 18. It's also a new paradigm. Uh, and this paradigm is first a new technological paradigm with an intense, huge, and huge uh, use of accelerators Uh, in terms of hardware. So it means that we have to cope with more heterogeneous architectures and it means for us in Impex to design software that are more agnostic to the hardware on which we want the software to be uh, run. The second point is that uh, the HPC machine won't be, uh, will be no more uh, an isolated machine and to be connected to uh, what we call the digital continuum, so to data centers to uh, uh, large instruments, scientific instruments. So here it's depicted uh, an SK, a square kilometer array, that will be a, a, a huge radio telescope um, that will be located in Australia and in South Africa, and in which there will be a, a very large number of data centers that will be connected to different HP machines and exascale systems. So we have to deal with uh, the huge amount of data that we, uh, that we we'll have to deal with, and, and to workflows of data that we we'll have to manage between the existing machine and outside the machine. And the last challenge is related to the way we use these machines. So traditionally, we have, we have been using these machines for uh, large-scale numerical simulations, but now we have to do with uh, uh, data analytics and large-scale data analysis, and also to the huge uh, use of uh, AI and, and more specifically deep learning. So we have to cope with three uh, different challenges. It's not just a question of number, it's just a question of how to, to use this, these machines. So if we have a look at the international initiatives, uh, so we have heard about, obviously, uh, the uh, well-advanced American uh, uh, initiative with already Frontier that is in production and, and quickly Aurora. And also in terms of development of softwares, ECP has been at the forefront of the development uh, of uh, softwares for, for exascale systems. And uh, they also, uh, They have been well advanced in terms of co-design of softwares with the application. It's a, one of the key points that, uh, and the key elements that we, we will implement within NUMPEX. In Japan, obviously, uh, people are working on the Fugaku Next. And also, uh, again, also in Japan, uh, there's a huge effort on, on co-designing software and hardware, uh, hardware related to, to the application. So that's the kind of strategy that uh, is very important and we are inspired by these initiatives. At the level of Europe, so um, there's a whole ecosystem uh, with different initiatives going from hardware with EPI, 
to uh, to yield uh, a sovereign European uh, processor. Uh, infrastructures are quickly led by UHPC, and also there are other initiatives related to applications like the series. Uh, this one we heard about Iroquois, for instance. Training and available of France, we are preparing. Uh, um, we, we get prepared for the arrival of a second European exascale system uh, in France that should be uh, in production by the end of 2025 20, uh, or early 2026. Uh, so, what is NUMPEX within these different initiatives? So, NUMPEX it's a national French national project that will focus on contribute to a European and French and European uh, exascale software stack. So we work on developing uh, software libraries that will be part of the uh, stacks that will be deployed uh, into uh, exascale systems. One key point is that we develop software, but we won't develop software without relationship with the applications. So we have hardware, we'll have hardware with, with, with exascale systems, we'll, have, we'll develop software, but we have to develop the software so that we have users and applications that use the software onto these machines. So, very quite similarly to the, uh, what happened in ECP, uh, we will work uh, with a, a co-design strategy. We will co-develop libraries uh, in close relationship with uh, the application uh, development teams. So, we'll give you a bit more details about this later. Also, we have to work out on building uh, a community of users uh, gathering people from uh, computer science uh, to uh, and, and mathematics to uh, the applications and also uh, software development uh, engineers. So it's a whole uh, a community with people that are not always talking to each other. So we have to work on aggregating this this very uh, large and heterogeneous um, uh, community. So it will go through co-design. It will go through training. That is very important. And as well, to prepare for the exascale challenges and also post exascale challenges, uh, we are already, uh, we're already working on fostering national and also international collaborations with our colleagues in Europe and outside Europe. So for instance, next uh, month, uh, we will have a meeting with people from uh, the DOE and, and from Japan and Europe uh, to um, work on common collaborations. So, we go through this. So with numbers, uh, it's a six years project that we start that starts now this year, with uh, a budget of 41 million euros uh, just to uh, um, just to pay for training uh, and also many uh, manpower. And if we have a look also at the in-kind uh, contribution from the different institutions that I mentioned, it's a total cost of 81 million euros. So basically, there will be more or less. Uh, 500 people that will be a bit more, 700 people that will work within NUPEX. So it gathers uh, all the institutions and uh, academic and, and some industries uh, of a, a French national community. It's composed of uh, different projects with three what we call focus projects uh, that I will uh, detail a bit further. And one that is devoted to um, uh, the digital, con digital continuum and how to deal with this uh, data workflows and one that is very important as well that will focus on applications. So let's have a look at the details of uh, the work plan of NumPEX. So NumPEX, uh, will, as I said, will be decomposed into six different projects. The first one is EXAMA, so it's related to the maths within um, uh, um, the HPC uh, uh, software stack. So it will mainly focus on uh, numerical solvers, on discretization, on uncertainty quantification. So these are the main topics that will be addressed here. <coughs> the second project, uh, called Exasoft, will focus on uh, everything that has to deal with computing, so how to make this code run on an HPC system. Uh, so in this project, we'll find runtimes, we'll find uh, programming models, uh, we'll find uh, uh, the development of libraries uh, for uh, servers, non numerical libraries, and as, as well uh, um, a huge work devoted to how to uh, save uh, in, um, energy when we run codes on, on these machines. The next one will be, uh, it's called Exadust, so it's related to data in the machine. 
So in this project, we find a uh, deployment of libraries for input and output storage, uh, institute data analytics, and as well uh, the development of machine learning based methods for data analysis within the uh, machine. The next one is Exator. It's related to uh, the digital continuum. And this project uh, will focus on how we deal with data workflows between uh, the exascale machine and outside the machine, so data centers, uh, uh, large instruments, uh, embedded system but outside the, uh, the, the exascale system, so the edge, basically. Um, and we, ha we have to deal with everything that has to deal with cyber security, uh, data governance, and so on and so forth. So the last one, uh, is devoted to how we work uh, with the application. So as I mentioned, the way we work with the application is essential. So we won't uh, work uh, like, okay, we develop codes and we just give codes to the applications and that's all. So what we want is just to first to analyze the needs coming from the applications and from these needs, try to build the libraries that answers to these needs in a kind of cycle uh, with uh, lots of interactions uh, in a sequential manner between the applications and the uh, different projects uh, that, are, that I mentioned, in which we develop libraries. So, uh, and this co-design uh, uh, strategy is at the heart uh, of Numpex in terms of software development, and it will be the core of the strategy, the main strategy that we'll be uh, using to, to work with the applications. If you want more details about um, the, uh, this project, this particular project, we are lucky to have here uh, Valérie Brenner, uh, who is co-leading this project, and that will be uh, very happy, I think, to give you more details about it. Um, as well, we have different projects focusing on different parts of the software stack. The key point is also to build uh, synergies between these different projects on key topics. So within Numpex, we have also different working groups. So here are just some working groups that just started to, to, um, to work now this year, but others will, will come later. Uh, one is devoted to software production and integration. So I will be talking more about this one next because it's related to our strategy in terms of sustainability which is the main topic uh, of uh, uh, this afternoon and today. One about resilience, resilience towards uh, faults, for instance, uh, and errors and so on. One is related to accelerator programming and how we push some solution uh, towards more agnostic, uh, hardware agnostic solutions in terms of software development. And for instance, Cocos could be uh, uh, one, of one solution, one potential, one potential solution. One is devoted to energy, which is the key elements uh, when we grow in terms of um, uh, computing capacity, and, and the energy cost is uh, a very important topic. And one is related to AI, AI for HPC, and how to use AI to accelerate simulation and to process a huge amount of data, but also uh, HPC for AI, how we use HPC system to uh, train LLM, for instance. Uh, and the last three working groups are devoted to gender equity and diversity, uh, to training, which is a, a very important topic because it's one way to uh, aggregate the community, uh, this very large and, and heterogeneous community that I mentioned, and one is related to international and, and national collaborations. Sport, so more specifically, in terms of sustainability within new packs, one key element that has been mentioned this, this morning by uh, Fabien Valigon is that, okay, Numpex, as I told you, is a production project with a clear focus uh, on the next uh, European exascale machine that will be installed uh, in, in France within the next two years. But also, um, with the exascale changes that I mentioned is related to new, new usages, new hardware, and this trend will probably, uh, will be probably the next the, the trend that we will see for, for, for post-exascale challenges with uh, a road towards uh, more heterogeneous hardware. So we, now we have GPUs or APUs, but next we probably, we probably have FPGA or even ASICs or chiplets. So we, we have to deal with more heterogeneous hardware. So uh, in terms of portability, that's a key challenge. As Fabien said this morning, uh, these exascale challenges in 10 years will be the kind of challenges we will have on regional centers, and in 10 years then it will be the kind of hardware that we have uh, in your personal computer. So we kind of 
solution that we'll find for these exascale challenges will be also solution solutions in the next years to um, uh, the problem that people will have even for uh, meso centers and also for personal computers. So that's really important to um, to focus on that. So it's not only related to uh, uh, HPC only and only to supercomputers or T0 uh, uh, supercomputers. The Unium PEX uh, sustainability will be approached with um, four different pillars. So these are the three pillars of software portability, interoperability, deployability on the machine, and also uh, user community. In terms of portability, uh, it's very important to uh, notice that developing uh, an application code, so CSE means uh, computational and science and engineering uh, application, um, is very uh, time consuming. The roadmaps are uh, multi year roadmaps, so it's a huge amount of work. And now, crafting codes for different hardware uh, is not an option, uh, with the fact that the trend is towards more heterogeneous uh, hardware. So we really need to work on common tools for all applications, or most of the applications that are uh, architecture agnostic. So th this will ensure the uh, portability of the software that will be uh, developing. And for the application, that's very important, because it means that if we succeed, uh, they, will access, they will have access to a kind of separation of concern between uh, application-dependent uh, components in their software that we will be uh, in charge of, and the hardware-dependent components that will be basically the kind of common hardware components, hardware-dependent components that we develop uh, uh, within UPEX. Uh, one very illustrative example is Warpix that won the Golden Bell Prize uh, last year. That really said, uh, people said, and, and people in Warpix said basically, without results from ECP like the MRX uh, uh, library, they won't be, uh, they wouldn't have been able to uh, design a highly portable uh, uh, application. So that's the kind of uh, application that we have in mind when we uh, try to develop this, uh, this strategy for uh, portability. The second pillar is interoperability. So the key point is that in terms of application code, what we deliver, deliver are basically a framework, so uh, a set of different components that we will uh, uh, design in SDK, so software development kits, that will be composed of interoperable softwares and libraries. So that's really important also for uh, the applications to know, to know that they can rely on, on these SDKs to build their uh, software uh, uh, development roadmap in the long term. So to build trust with the applications, so portability is important, but also interoperability is important. We can really build their roadmap on tools, on different libraries that are uh, uh, fully interoperable. So one of the key points in, in UPEX is that we will deliver these SDKs that will be composed of uh, interoperable, interoperable softwares. The third point, the deployability. So we have any case, uh, we have, uh, we hope that we'll be, what will develop uh, uh, performance portable uh, softwares, but we have to deploy these softwares on different uh, machines. So within Impex, uh, what we want to do is to push forward uh, new development and deployment methodologies, and basically uh, we we'll put a strong effort on uh, uh, packaging managers, package managers like SPAC, Vix, and Nix. So what we decided now is to support uh, three of these uh, package managers and uh, when we de uh, deliver um, uh, SDKs, we package these SDKs with uh, SPAC, Mix and Mix. For deployability, we will have also to work uh, with the national centers, the national centers, so that they adopt uh, package management uh, uh, like uh, these three ones. And also, uh, there will be, within this international collaboration, a strong effort to push forward the use of uh, 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 package management softwares. Another point is that within Impex, we will also develop a, a, a Git CI uh, and to, uh, to open uh, to anyone uh, complaining or to anyone to test the, the developments that we will be doing uh, uh, within Impex. Uh, the last point is the community of users. So it has been mentioned several times this morning, so it's a key point. 
Um, so if you want to uh, do a good job uh, that is useful for the applications, we have to enlarge the community of users. So our goal is basically to work on common tools that can be adopted by a large community. So one of the key uh, uh, elements of Numpex is basically to work out in close relationship with the application domains and teams to um, push the adoption uh, of the kind of tools and libraries that will be uh, developing. And so this is essential uh, to have in mind that uh, people in the application have to trust our developments, so trust, trust means that they need visibility or long-term visibility uh, to build their uh, development roadmap. And for sustainability, it means that for us, we need to ensure that the code that we'll be developing can be maintained and uh, can evolve in the long term. So it's related to, uh, so that's a cycle that I think Christian Trout and, and uh, Edouard Monique mentioned this morning, but this virtuous um, circle between community, uh, the kind of work that we can do in terms of development, portability, and so on that I mentioned. And, but one key point is that having uh, these four pillars uh, working is not enough. We have to work also on a business model. Uh, so that's the last point that I want to mention with a, a question mark. So we just started. We have money, but already we have to work on what's next and how to uh, maintain and, and make this code evolve uh, after an impact. Uh, it's a key, it's very important for the, the application teams to, to clearly build uh, uh, long term roadmaps. So to sum up, um, so NumPex is a software development project. So we aim at uh, contributing to the European software stack for the XS game. Um, we, I hope that I convince you that we work close, uh, in close relationship with the applications to co-develop libraries that can be useful for uh, the application codes and, and teams. Um, here I mentioned the four pillars on which we build our sustainability uh, strategy with portability, interoperability, interoperability, dependability, and the fact that we have to work hard to um, uh, have a, a large community of users. Community of users, but also we have to work with uh, computational centers to also make these uh, uh, developments deployable on, on these machines. Thank you. Kind of thing. So there's a whole package uh, within the XAD project that I mentioned that is related to, that is devoted specifically to uh, uh, software production and integration. So there's a working group that I mentioned that is related to, to that working on that. So right now there has been a, a seminar on packaging. So uh, and one of the results is that so this seminar is that we will support uh, Gixnet and, 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 and Stack. And very likely we will uh, contribute to Spark, Nix and Nix, uh, specifically on HPC centric uh, specificities. Easy Build is one of the um, uh, solutions that has been mentioned. Nothing has been stated or decided about Easy Build, but that could be also an option. So we just started, uh, so that's a kind of discussion that is uh, in progress, but nothing has been. Uh, could be a solution. No, I, think, I think it will be interesting. There's a number of big soldiers in Europe that have an eye on producible. Some have like, like a mix of the spark in this To me, it, it, it would make sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question or comment for Jerome? Okay, so thank you very much, Jerome.
Okay, so the title of my talk was Software Stacks and Sustainability in DOE, and now it's Software Stacks and Stewardship in DOE. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about why uh, as, I, as I go through this. So, as folks know, the Exascale Computing Project is ending. Who's, who's aware of this? Is it, raise your hand. Okay, great. Yeah, most people. It's, it's just my slides are ending too. That's it. Okay, one more time. One more time. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was the presentation. Um, that's, yeah. So ECP was a huge project. It's seven years, $1.7 billion of total investment. It's six core DOE laboratories and probably 17 of the other laboratories. Um, there are seven, a total of people, uh, people from 17 laboratories contributing. Um, three core focus areas with 24 applications and 70 different software projects um, and 80 different teams and over 1,000 researchers. So it's a huge project. Um, and you know, it ends in December of this year, at least the technical side. There's there's a sort of administrative wrap up happening next year, and then ECP is, is done. Um, this was a huge effort on the software side um, to establish hierarchical integration um, for the, the different parts of the software ecosystem. And so, if you look at the structure of the software part of ECP, um, we we ended up with something like this, and it, where. At the bottom, um, there are all the different individual software projects. So that's Etsy, it's Paraview, and Trilino, it's Visit, SuperLU, all of these different tools that you've heard of. Um, and they were sort of organized into these SDKs, sort of like the Numpex guys we're talking about now. Um, we call those software development kits. Um, they're probably more aptly called product communities. And, and what their function was, was to take a bunch of related products and make sure that they could be used together. Um, and that they could be built and linked together in the same application, or really whatever integration made sense for that particular ecosystem. Um, the point of, of that uh, was really so that applications could leverage these things together, because one of the goals under ECP was for the software ecosystem to support the key applications that, um, that, that were defined under, under ECP to be fixed with the mission apps for ECP. Um, and all of the different software products were integrated um, into E4S, which is the Extreme PL Scientific Software Stack. That's ECP's stack. Um, and that sort of that provided, it, they did regular releases, um, I think, it, it, and uh, they would build everything together, not necessarily with the same version across the stack, but it, it was, it, it's, it's a level of integration that we had not seen for this ecosystem um, prior to ECP. Um, and then E4S is a subset of um, packages within stack, which is a package manager that you just heard about. Um, I leave the stack project, um, just a disclaimer. And um, under SPAC, there's lots of other communities and software products um, being integrated into sort of a, a common system. And so you know, this, this is a lot of software. Um, if you look at E4S itself, this is, this is the dependency graph for at least for, for one configuration of E4S. Um, the red stuff at the top there is the roughly 100 packages uh, that are sort of key parts of E4S. They're the main products. Um, but if you look at this graph, um, there's over 600 total packages uh, in E4S. There's over 500 things that you have to go and, and build just to get the 100 core packages working. Um, and so really, the ECP ecosystem relies on a ton of open source. Um, this is true of you know, most applications as well. Um, each application is essentially its own software stack. This is a Livermore production code, but the ECP ones are similar. Um, this, there are, you know, this, this is a, a proprietary code developed at Livermore where there's 30 internal packages there are open source packages in there, and there's a whole bunch of open source sitting under it. And so, you know, that's nearly three fourths of the total packages that are open source, um, and two thirds that are that are actually external open source that we have developed at the lab. And so, you know, this DOE's ecosystem um, across most of the applications relies on a whole ton of things from the broader open source ecosystem. Um, Stack has been a big part of integration under ECP. Um, if you, Stack started before ECP, you know, sort of like Cocos, um, and then it, it sort of became widely used within the Exascale project. And you know, it's, it benefits from essentially contrib contributions from all over the HPC ecosystem. Um, we could not integrate something like E4S without the you know, roughly 1,200 contributors to Stack over the life of the project, or all the people who are working on those you know, 500 other packages that are outside of ECP um, that, that make the, uh, the E4S stack work. Um, and so, you know, the, the reason that we were successful with the integration under ECP, I think, um, is actually because we considered the broader ecosystem. Where it's, it wasn't just a project focused on the packages within ECP. There have been attempts to sort of unify those things in the past. Um, it was a project focused on you know, how, the, how the ecosystem functions as a whole. What, what are all the parts that we need to maintain? 
Um, and we developed integration techniques um, for deploying this stuff at, uh, at facilities. And so this was, uh, to some extent, the hardware integration part of ACP. Um, where you, know, we, you, you could view SPAC as sort of the, the, the bleeding edge moving along over time um, with external contributions coming in from GitHub to the main line of SPAC. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's getting four to 400 to 600 changes per month. The, 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 the repo moves very fast. Um, we do regular releases of that, maybe twice a year now, um, where we sort of freeze the packages and say, here's a stable release. Um, and we, we back for bug fixes to those releases. And then E4S itself um, tends to branch off of there. And there's a whole lot of downstream effort right now um, that, that, it, that goes in to get essentially that chunk of the SPAC ecosystem working across the Exascale facilities within the day. Um, and so that involves local builds and testing, it involves local configuration, making sure that everything is set up right for the machine, um, actual installation on the machine, and then you know, local modules and everything that you need to make it work for that particular facility. Um, and that ends up being, in, in applications um, consumed from all of these different places. So an application may have you know, its own stack of recipes um, where it's pulling from the you know, mainline stack, um, it may pull from a staple release, they may pull from E4S versions of things, and they may pull from the special version of E4S that's deployed at a particular facility. Um, and so, one of the things that we've struggled with um, over, over ECP is how fast this mainline uh, branch moves here. And, and so, you know, when applications update from um, release to release, um, there are a lot of changes that go into that. And so we've tried really hard um, over, the, over the course of the project to move um, as much of this work as possible upstream. So to have um, extensive testing um, on the main line of stack. And I think um, there is still, this is a gap, um, there's still a ton of effort that goes into making these things work at facilities because they are sort of their own special snowflake machines still. Um, and so one of the things that we would like to do um, eventually is to have um, you know, some sort of testing that's representative of the facility, so something that we could build you know, outside of them so that that environment is in fact reproducible or we can produce a distribution that would actually work at these, on all of these fancy machines. Um, we leverage a lot of infrastructure to keep that ecosystem working. Um, if you look at SPAC itself, it's a, it's a tool. Um, we have a bunch of people contributing to package recipes. And then there's a whole bunch of CI infrastructure. And on top of that, you can build all of these different software stacks, each of which is kind of its own ecosystem. And the CI architecture that we've built up over ECP um, has had to scale quite a bit. Um, and so I think, I think this kind of flies under the radar sometimes that this is sitting behind SPAC. Um, but early on, you know, we didn't have CI. We weren't testing these projects on a regular basis anywhere. Um, and we, we relied on the maintainers to make sure that they worked when they, when they contributed. And that leads to rot over time, right? The recipes sort of go out of, um, they, they don't work anymore. Um, and we've had to build up a CI system where now, you know, we have, we have a Kubernetes instance sitting in AWS, we have a high availability GitLab instance, we have a whole bunch of runners that farm out jobs to AWS instances, and we have a cluster of machines at the University of Oregon that are providing you know, similar machines to what's at the facilities, but in, in my opinion, still not good enough. Right? It's, it's not mirroring the facility environment exactly, um, but we are able to do a ton of builds on these things. Um, and you know, that's, that's been good. It has, made, it has lowered the burden of maintaining a whole lot of binary distributions. Um, essentially, if you look at a traditional package manager um, for, say, Linux, like if you look at APT, um, you've got a recipe per package configuration. Um, you throw that in the build farm. You get packages that all have to work together in a single stack, and um, you, know, you maintain that over time. Um, for HPC, it's much more complicated. You, you, you're trying to maintain packages to work portably across a bunch of different systems, and you're spitting out binaries for all of those different systems and making sure that the builds and tests continue to work over time. And so this is what we've simplified this back, right? We have parameterized recipes um, that say how to build on all of these different systems. We can throw that into a build farm with you know, eight minimal changes across the different machines, and we can spit out optimized binaries for all of the different stacks and, and, and basically generate custom stacks. And at the same time, um, we allow developers, like application developers and their users, um, to build from source on top of those binaries. Um, and so I think this is, this is key to at least the way that the HPC community works, right? You want to be able to rely on what's there on the system, you want to be able to rely on known, known working binaries, but you also need to be able to build stuff from source on top of that, because you're constantly changing things for experimentation. Um, we've enabled people to you know, define stacks that they can build. Um, and, and, and basically, this is what it takes to get something into CI. You write a little YAML file like this, 
with a list of packages that you want. These are the names of stack recipes. Um, and you can provide customization up there. Like, so this is building for um, CUDA. So you disable lock and you enable CUDA. You say what CUDA arch you want. And it spits out builds for that. Um, we've been able to take something like this, port it to one API fairly easily by just changing the, the compiler settings and some of the, the, the variants across the stack. And so Spec really simplifies the process of, um, of, of taking an entire stack and moving it from platform to platform. Um, the CI ecosystem is doing over 100,000 builds a week, um, and that's like 8,300 plus CPU hours um, to keep everything building. We're doing PR testing, and so what this bottom plot is showing is the rebuilds um, that are happening basically on the mainline branch as it goes over time. So that's sort of the latest you know, bleeding edge branch. And then you know the entire stacks are also being built within pull requests by people who are contributing you know, these, these lists of packages that need to work together. And we go and build that, integrate it into the mainline, and keep going. Um, and then this top plot is showing all of the different instance types that we're building on across AWS. We have logic basically to take these types of builds, form them out to different microarchitecture machines, um, in the AWS fleet and leverage spot as much as possible. Um, and this has made possible both by those machines at University of Oregon and by companies from AWS. So it's a whole lot of effort that goes into um, the software stack. And I, you know, I've heard people say that continuous integration is something that we left on the floor um, in, in ECP or that you know, we didn't get to. I, I think there's been a ton of good work on CI within ECP to support the software stack, at least at the integration level. So we have this back CI system. Uh, we've scaled out integration similar to this for the different SDKs, so at the community level. People are integrating things and testing them across the platforms and making sure that they work. Um, we developed a secure runner for HPC systems called Jackamar um, that allows you to run CI as a secure service across all your systems. And you know, that's actually been used within NNSA, at least, to do cross-site CI. So at Livermore, we can send in a job, and, or we can push to a Git repo, and we can have tests run at Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia um, just from that push. And so I think that's been a success. Um, the place where I think we, there, there are gaps left that we need to work on going forward is that Project CI is still a problem, right? So it, it's, it's going to take more effort than what we had here um, to get CI for HPC systems, a reliable CI for HPC systems at the project level for the individual projects working on GitHub who need to test on the HPC machines. And I think a lot of that is um, security, right? Like you can't just trigger jobs from anyone on an HPC machine. And so we need ways to work that out. That's something we're thinking about in the future. Um, but this has been a lot of progress. Um, and this is necessary to achieve this level of integration across the stack. Um, so you know, I think the wins under ECP um, were, were product support. We got a lot of money for product support and moved the, the needle on that. Um, we have unprecedented scale of integration. It's a you know, stack of 100 packages and 600 total uh, packages. It's, it's huge. Um, the portability across GPUs and CPUs is something that I don't think um, other communities have done, at least not at this scale. And so that's a huge benefit of the, of the funding. And you know, it made the applications um, actually start to rely heavily on dependency libraries. I think um, for many years, we had a lot of applications that said, I will never use dependencies. I don't need to. I can go it alone. And GPUs were the thing that were just complicated enough for the physicists to say, whoa, that's too much. That's enough for, um, for me. I need to rely on someone else's library. And so I think that's been a, that's been a big um, but, you know, like I said, the project's ending. So how do we sustain all this? Um, what do we do now? Um, so a little history. Um, this has been a known problem that there's a funding cliff at the end of ECP um, since at least 2020. Um, and I guess I'll do this thing where I did my slide on the fly. There we go. Uh, since at least October of 2020. Um, there was a report um, where the ASCAP, which is an advisory committee to Oscar, uh, recommended a stewardship program. Um, and they said, you know, you should you should create a shared software stewardship program to sort of offload the software ecosystem onto after ECP. Um, so you're right, Bob. Um, and they put out an RFI um, on stewardship of software. And so a lot of people put a lot of time into these. If you haven't read them, um, there's actually really great input from all the labs um, in these reports. Um, and essentially, it covers things like you know, what are the dependencies that you rely on? What do you need for workforce? What kinds of things should go into a software stewardship program? And so on. Um, and um, there were you know, the next steps listed um, for this RFI when Oscar covered it all up were to put out some FOAs, to put out some some uh, funding calls um, to support the software. And so the next year, um, you know, there was not a funding call yet, um, but we got the Strict Science Act, which um, which had some language in it that said that Congress cared about the Exascale software stack, which was good. Um, and so you know, it said such products must be maintained and improved in order that the full potential of the deployed system can, can be continuously realized. Um, and then in October 22 to uh, February 
um, we've had this sequence call within DOE. And um, you know, this, this has been um, an interesting exercise. Essentially, they said, you know, we're going to have um, several projects with a budget of around 120K each, which is not very much, um, to explore what it would take to have a sustainability program. So six projects were selected, um, and we've been doing workshops and planning since early this year within DOE to try to figure out what a sustainability program ought to look like. And that has culminated um, in this sort of phase two stewardship program, not sustainability, but stewardship, indicating that we should continue to advance the stack and not just sustain it, um, where there are actually seven projects um, that, are, that are basically requested to join forces for a combined stewardship organization. So this is what the next generation of DOE sustainability is going to look like. Um, there are seven projects, the leads for which, um, some of whom are in this room. So PESO is one that's focused on the sort of integrated effort. Um, there is one that's going to support math libraries, data, viz, and various products. Uh, mostly it's also aligned with SIDAC, which is another program within DOE. And then there are some community-specific ones. So SWAT step and S4PST are focused on workflows and tools um, and programming models. And then there's uh, CoLabs, which Anshu is leading, and, um, yeah, and Terry here is leading step. Um, CoLabs is focused on workforce training, best practices, and coordination with RSEs. And then finally, there's this OSF one um, that's focused on partnering with foundations to advance stewardship. Um, and so that's, that's the plan. Um, again, the focus is on stewardship, not sustainability. Um, the interesting thing about the call is that there's going to be a um, shared governance model. All the projects have to get together and come up with a way um, that they can work together um, that doesn't sort of cement the leadership, that rotates the leadership over time, that has the elections or a rotating chair or something, um, and a model for expanding in the future. Um, currently, this is packed at something like $14 million um, for um, the whole thing, and, and that's probably not nearly enough for the product support that's needed going forward, but it's expected to expand. And so um, the, this governance structure has to account for that and account for sort of changing budgets over time so that DOE can maintain its program um, into the future. Um, and then an interesting thing in the call is that DOE is strongly encouraging contributions from external stakeholders. Uh, so, you know, that's that's where we're at right now. This is sort of the, the state of, of sustainability in DOE with um, a few months to the end of ECP. Um, and so alongside this, um, as Christian mentioned earlier, we've started looking at software foundations as a way that we could at least broaden the reach of the ecosystem and leverage some of the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, which is really that this stuff has to be maintained not just as an exclusive community within DOE, but as a broader thing where we, you know, we get more folks involved. Um, Oscar is very keen on that because um, they would like external uh, stakeholders to contribute to the ecosystem and to actually you know, have an interest in the software packages um, that are there. And so you know, if, if you look at software foundations, um, they are sort of neutral entities set up um, to sustain software projects. And, and they're neutral because you don't want undue influence from one organization like DOE. They enable people to come together and sort of feel like they're in unbiased collaboration. Um, and you know they, they often have tax benefits, so they're nonprofit corporations. So they're like 5013Cs or 5013Sixes in the U.S. I'm not sure what the nonprofit structure looks like in Europe, um, but it, it's similar. Um, there's a lot of existing models, so you've probably heard of some of these foundations. So there's Apache, Numfocus, Linux, and, and Cloud Native, and there are lots of sizes for these things. So if you look at the, the sizes of foundations right now, um, so the LLVM Foundation, which is just for one project, is something like 800,000 a year. Um, PSF, the Python Software Foundation, is two, is two million a year. And you know, Eclipse is slightly bigger than these sort of um, single millions of dollars a year foundations of 26 million. They've been around a while. And then dwarfing all of those um, is, is Linux Foundation with something like, I think they have 280 million a year revenue for the, for the past year um, for where they're able to raise that much uh, funding for helping projects. Um, and foundations typically fund um, a lot of different things. So they fund mostly project support, um, which it, it will, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's things like community infrastructure, operations, events. Um, they, they fund the Linux kernel and the Linux Foundation, um, and, and some internal operations. The project support stuff um, is it's not main it's not mainline feature development. It, it's typically things like you know infrastructure, it's metric tracking, it's making sure that the project is healthy, doing web development, and all the things that developers don't typically want to do. Um, and it's also marketing. Um, it's making other folks aware. Of, um, of what the projects are doing and, and making sure that the right adopters find the projects and, and start using them. So really, you know, you could look at the goal of an organization like this as uh, increasing contribution to the projects and increasing you know, the, the, the level of, of usage, which ultimately leads to increased contribution. Um, and, you know, like I said, they don't fund 
the, the project support. And, and so, you know, or at least not typically, you can, you can have like a scope project within Linux Foundation. You could say like, okay, we're gonna do a push to improve the docs or a push to improve this feature. But they don't typically take on sort of the long-term leaks. That's expected to come from in-kind effort because it is really sustaining a community organization. So, you know, as Christian said earlier in his talk, um, we still do need the money um, to come from the, the parties that have uh, a vested interest in the organization. But the hope, you know, something like a foundation is really that you could get external parties um, to you know, be more likely to contribute to that. Because it's neutral, they can get a stake in the governance over time, they could have some ownership in the project. Um, and so you know, what can foundations do for DOE? I think, if you do it right, um, they could actually provide growth. Um, because the, the open governance allows for stakeholders to get into the projects. Um, neutral homes, I've been told by some companies, like for Stack, for example, that they didn't want to mention it on their slides um, because it was a little more specific thing. Um, and, it, and it really isn't, right? We have contributions from lots of places, but just because it's not in a neutral organization, I've had people say, you know, we don't want to put that on our slides. We don't want to recommend it um, because we don't know where it's going to go in the future. And so you get some degree of stability out of this. Um, you can grow contributors. Um, and then, you know, hopefully the adoption drives more investment, and this is a virtuous cycle over time. Um, broader adoption from the right folks um, can get you a lot of project support. So, you know, most of the capital right now is over in the Facebooks, Amazons, Google, and Microsofts of the world. Um, they are, you know, putting a lot of money into things like Cloud HPC, which we could be interested in. And I've had people say, like, well, you know, DOE software is not of interest um, to folks outside of DOE. It's niche. And I think that's a myth. Um, you know, we had recently um, Amazon release a code, a quantum code called Palace, um, that was based on the Amazon out of Livermore. They actually didn't tell us that they were doing it. They just put it out there and said, hey, we built this open source code, and it's built on Amazon. Um, and so, you know, I think if you have the right sort of outward looking strategy for your project, if you actually take an interest in recruiting users and getting more adoption, um, you, could, you could make things like this happen and you could drive contributions from external places. Um, we've gotten contributions back from them. Um, on this on this stuff, at least for the things that made sense to integrate into mainline Amazon. And so I think that's good. Um, so the goal would be to have a foundation existing alongside DOE stewardship program um, and you know providing outreach and community building, um, you know, in particular with industry, which we haven't interacted in, you know, in my opinion, as much as we could um, in DOE, but also with you know broader other contributors like say the European community or um, academia and other places. I think we could get much stronger connections um, if we open up the governance and, and just make it clear that people can be involved in these projects. Um, and so, you know, what about an umbrella for HPC? Um, like I said, clouds are growth area. Um, we have this portability stack, which is becoming um, very interesting, I think, to industry right now when, you know, it takes five months to get an H100. Um, I think the ability to run uh, across different types of GPUs is going to be a pretty hot commodity here um, in the future. And so, you know, promoting our stacks where we've already had seven years of experience doing this um, is better than letting industry reinvent that again like they did with the cloud. Um, and so, you know, I think I think we stand a chance of um, allowing this to sort of define a portable stack for HPC that could be used across um, you know, industry, government, and academia. Um, so Christian and I are have been pushing um, to start this High Performance Software Foundation. Um, and you know, this, is, this is somewhat independent of the seedling effort, but like I said, we want it to stand alongside it. We want to work closely um, with the DOE program. Um, we're including some of the DOE projects as initial ones, basically the ones that have broad communities already. So Stack, Cocos, and MPitch, um, and HPC Toolkit have expressed interest in being member projects. Um, we're talking to possible in initial members um, who could provide funding for this. And um, you know, we're planning to launch this, um, at, or announce the intent to launch this at SC and to sort of form the foundation in early, early next year. So if you're interested, um, get in touch. Um, you know, we've, also, we've had some really good discussions with folks like CEA here um, and others. And so um, you know, hopefully we can make this a broader effort and um, we can contribute to the sustainability plan post ECP. Thanks. CD for the application. So, are you uh, mentioned some uh, 
、あのオートマティカティスティングのサモシェフティのあーのです、ね、もう少しサモはベンチマックスをサモはサクターのパフォーマンスでサモで、あのあカチラシオブのプログラム、So how do you make it such kind of testing program to provide for each package? Um, it, so, I mean, I guess a lot of scaling is the answer so far. Yeah, so uh, it, getting the sort of common pull request workflow that people are used to、um, to work with the, the sort of distribution build model that SPAC has、um, has been a, a pretty big effort over time. And, and I think you know, it, it, the, the answer really is aggressive caching.、Um, and so we have build caches of all the stuff that we've built so far.、Um, and you know, we, we reuse those in CI. If we took away the caching, the thing would be、uh, utterly intractable. Um, but because of that, we're able to you know, only rebuild what's needed and allow people to work on you know, pretty large changes to the ecosystem. You can change something at the base,、um, you can change you know, Python, you can change Cocos and have all the things that rely on Cocos get tested with it. And so, in, in some ways, it's like a distributed monorepo the way that we're doing that.、Um, it, but you know, different packages can be at different versions at different times, and which I think is you know, different from your traditional distro model.、Um, for the future, like you mentioned, benchmarking. So,、uh, Olga is here somewhere.、Um, we, we have been working with,、um, with, with folks on, with Recan,、um, AWS, and, and Google Cloud on this sort of continuous benchmarking project、um, where we'd like to add、um, you know, testing and benchmarking to the mix. Where you could define, you know, sort of like you define a software stack right now, you could define a benchmark suite in much the same way and say, here's the packages that I want to benchmark. And you could run that in a similar CI system. Um, we would need more. Like, we would need like, little Slurm clusters popping up in the cloud and running on and off.、Um, but that's, that's the stuff that we're looking into. And so I think you know, both of those things、um, could be the sorts of core infrastructure that you could provide out of the foundation. Because paying for CI, paying for you know, working on sort of a collaborative project across facilities and,、um, and, and clouds、um, is something that you could, you could house under a foundation and provide you know, maybe as project CI to,、um, to projects who are under the foundation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep.、Uh, I think I have asked the same question before, maybe talking about、uh, software stewardship discussion. Okay. So, for CI and CD, for software testing, I, you know,、uh, as a representative of S4 PSD, programming、mm -hmm. systems.、Uh, Uh, work、uh, on community. I have seen many of the programming systems have very unique、uh, requirements for CI CD compared to like、uh, scientific libraries or、sure. applications. And、uh, I think currently, E4S, of course, I understand they are doing a great job. So the question is、uh, how to make the, these, type, these type of services more individualized? Do you think if, if you, you have to maybe? Now you get E4S for that direction, or maybe are you going to leverage、uh, foundation ideas to support that type of needs? Right, so, personally, I think the main obstacle to that is technical.、Um, and, and the, the reason, so I think you need similar scale for your CI system.、Um, and but, but the reason that we've been able to do it for the integration testing and not the project testing is because the integration testing is one project. And so we can basically say, like, okay. We, we know who's contributing to this, and we trust the maintainers of this project. And so we can run this stuff in unique places.、Right? Um, I think to do Project CI correctly, you're going to need some kind of bridge from, say, GitHub to local authentication, to, to local, you know, authentication and authorization,、mm -hmm. so that you know that the person who pushed to the GitHub project is trusted.、Right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can't run their code on a DOE system. That's, that's the main obstacle, it's just this security value. So, if we can get something like that in place, then I think you could do this for projects, and you could basically say these you know, projects or these maintainers are, are trusted. We believe that their CI can be run on some piece of you know, some partition of, a, of you know, a, a DOE facility or another HPC facility. But it's really the fact that the HPC facilities are walled off that prevents a lot of the most unique parts of the HPC ecosystem from being tested that way. So, I think that's how you have to scale up the project CI. It's, it's really authentication and authorization. Okay, the security stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good, thank you. Hello, just a quick question. So, for initial part, if you have your HPSF,、uh, mm -hmm. how would you envision like, applying, say, all the parties who are interested in, or even potentially competitors, like、uh, somebody
Uh, can they apply? Or I think we would totally consider easy build. It's it has a community. Mm -hmm. It's targeted for production use, um, and you know I think you know, they're widely used within the HPC community. Um, I it, what we're working out is um, what the criteria would be to become sort of a fully graduated project within the foundation, right? And if you look at the other ones like CNCF, um, they have a large sandbox, which I think <coughs> basically any project can become a Linux Foundation project and then get in the CNCF sandbox. I think we would want something like that. The sandbox doesn't get full access to all the resources that the project provides, um, but they do get you know marketing and they get you know promotion and you can say like, hey, look at these projects. They they want to you know um, be used. Please adopt them. Um, and then you know once you do a bit more work, you get to incubation. And there's usually a clear path from incubation to graduation. And I think you know what, what you need for that is things like testing, um, some way to report bugs, to, you know, open governance for your project, um, and you know, basically to be targeted for production use. Um, and I think that's really the path that we want to set. Like if, if the project is looking to have an external community and to have and to have broad usage, then I think it's something that makes sense here. Um, if not, then you know, and, and if they don't want to interact with sort of the external world, then it's probably not the right place. But I don't. I don't anticipate this being an exclusive thing, which is why. So we just started this. That's why there's only four projects there. If you're interested, get in touch with us. Thank you. Is there any other question? No. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. The last speaker uh, of this uh, session. Pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, after the previous speaker, I have to have a word of warning. I'm Italian. I'm married to an Argentinian. I live in France. So English is not exactly the same level as what you have before. Okay? So I will try to survive. That's <coughs> so uh, a few words of presentation. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, for people that like this kind of game, I have this number is three. I have spent 30 years doing teaching, research, and education a quarter of a century promoting open source software, a bit more than 10 years taking care of, I mean, I mean when you get old and you have a baby, you basically feel the responsibility of building organization or running organization for the common good. So the, the one of the, my two hats here is one as a member of the National Committee for Open Science here in France as a founder and director of Software Heritage, and I will touch upon these two issues today. So first of all, we have mentioned software a lot. Uh, I would like just to remind you that the software doesn't come out to the viewer. The rule is actually written by humans for viewers. And we have beautiful pieces of software that are available today. I mean, and this is a fantastic except, except of the source code uh, controlling command module. Uh, there were 60,000 lines of this kind of code on board of the uh, lunar landing module. Thanks to a lady, Margaret Hamilton, who actually directed the group, a team of engineers who developed this software back then. And uh, you see, the point is that source code is important because you have comments for humans and not just instruction for machines. You may say, I mean, this is just because what, this was assembly, but you fast forward a little bit, now this is a language which is more familiar to you, uh, and you still have comments, I mean, at least, okay, okay, I picked a very complicated piece of software, and you can spend an afternoon on, on, on this ultra famous routine for computing one of a square root of x without using floating point. I mean, this actually uh, is in the source code of Quay 3 Arena uh, um, by John Carmack, but um, he didn't write this code. This is, uh, goes down to the dark ages of computer graphics. And as Len Schuster, who was a uh, board director of the Computer History Museum, said so actually having access to the source code provides us with a view into the mind of the designer, which is so true, okay? Of course, we have users who want to run the software. If you want to understand what happens, modify, adapt it, or use it, you need access to the source code. And now the important point is that software is really a pillar of open science. You have, been, you have seen this a lot of time in the presentation today, but let, let me say it again. First of all, now, thanks to uh, an exercise by the French uh, uh, Minister of Research, we have, for the first time, hard data that shows that in all disciplines in research, 
you have people developing and sharing software, not just using Excel to do bogus things in biology. And, uh, and, uh, and so these numbers are live. The, everything blue on the slides actually links. We share the slides, and, and my old professor, Habit Fox, is me to put a reference to everything I say, so you can check it is not just here. So you can. And when you do, when you think about open science, I mean, we are thinking about making available the full process of science, so it is not enough to have open access, which is very really important, it has been a long fight, it's not finished. It is not enough to have access to the data sets. We also need access to the software that we use to create, modify, transform these data sets. And of course, the links here are very important. Now, if you think a little bit about, more about software, you will see that depending on who you are, the same piece of software can be a tool, because you are using it, can be a research output, because it is a result of the research output of a team near to you, or it can be even a subject of study, because some friends of you can be in software engineering, they are studying the way you build software and find out the good, good indicators to see if software is developed the right way. You know, if you want to actually uh, exploit all the facets of software this way, you need to have access to the source code. And not just access to the source code, actually access to the history of development of source code. Though the version control is super important, in particular for reproducibility. Okay. Uh, now let me insist a little bit uh, here. Sometimes in, in uh, communities different from this one, uh, people think that actually taking care of software is not very different from taking care of data. Okay, software is just a sequence of bits. So the same way you can build an archive for data, you can build an archive for software. Well, let me disagree. I mean, software is actually very different from data. It evolved over time. The development system is very important there. And it is a very complex thing. It can be a complex thing because your piece of software is very complex. We have seen uh, the hundreds of thousand lines of C++. Or millions of lines, I mean, the Linux kernel is almost 30 million lines today, right? But it can also be just two lines of code in your script that put in tons of dependencies. We have seen some dependency graph before. I mean, this little picture here is what happens in your machine if you just run a one line in the Python script and you say import matplotlib, right? which is just a library for drawing. You put in all this stuff. So actually, you have a large web of dependencies, which are easy to break, complex to maintain. You have developer communities. I mean, it's very, very, very different than, than just maintaining data. And the human side is fundamental. So the community, documentation, algorithm, funding, etc., etc. So it's, it's a very special thing. Now, the big question is, how are we managing our software today? I will propose to you to look at this issue from two points of view. One, which is academia, the other, which is industry or, or maybe uh, in, I mean, in governments. In academia, we have issues about reproducibility that we mentioned before. Okay? Even in my community, I'm a computer scientist, I'm working in software engineering recently. <coughs> you would expect computer scientists, software engineering, produce fully reproducible, completely accessible uh, 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 articles with all the source code that can be downloaded and run and compiled and etc. Well, forget about it. It's not, uh, not, not at all the case today. Uh, but also maintenance, how do you have sustainability, etc. Here is a selection of papers and give the point as you will see some many, many different things. Also reproducibility. I will not go into this, okay, because when you start writing code in uh, using strange system reproducibility is a nightmare. Then on the industry facet, I mean, you have security, integrity, traceability. You remember all this? I mean, Love4J, Love4Shell, all these vulnerabilities you have heard, tons of them are coming. Uh, and these can be caused software systems have become so complex that we must rely on tons of components that come from elsewhere that we cannot control and that we cannot rebuild our own, by our own. So we need to have actually traceability uh, uh, of the full software supply chain, which is not an easy thing. Now, the awareness is raising at the level of public policy here. For today, I will not go into this area specifically because I do not have the time and I have been asked to focus on this area here. But there will be a lot of things to say in this area. Too. And, and many of these issues are actually the same. The technology and the solution are very similar to one or the other of the problems. So let's go. 
What is it? The, the emerging policy framework in academia. Okay. 2019, for example, here at UNESCO, we, we had this uh, meeting of 40 international experts on the relevance of software so code for society. This was not just academia, just it was very broad, but inside the recommendation we find one of these. I mean, promote software development as a valuable research activity. I have heard many of you questioning the issue of sustainability of the software package. One of the reasons why we have this issue is that the effort of developing quality software is not recognized enough in academia. Okay, in that you can matter of money, of course, but not only, also in, in, in your prestige in the institution. And you have also now the, the open source, the open source in the UNESCO Commission of Open Science in 2021. Uh, the European Open Science Club, which is actually most devoted to data and computer, very little to software, still has today a few bits of software inside it. And uh, more recently, you can find uh, uh, a software working group has been launched in Science Europe. In Germany, the DFK, which is a national funding agency, now has a special section on software production when you apply for funding or you apply for a promotion, which is Groundbreaking. Usually, it was just your IG index and your number of publications. And NASA, in, uh, in uh, last year, unveiled the open science policy, transformed open science, and uh, a strong drive on, on uh, open source in there. This is just a selection. But then, uh, what is actually at stake here? Well, let, let me make you a, a, a shopping list. Imagine you have a piece of software that has already written, already been written, already uh, packaged. Well, the first thing you would like to make sure is that this software can be reproduced later on. So this means the source code should be available, and you should know which version of the source code you are using. Okay. So this is, for this, for this you need an archive, you need reference. And the other point that you need is finding the software you are interested in. For this you need proper metadata describing the software and mechanism which is better than asking the coffee machine or the mailing list or on Google. Uh, what is the best package for my application. And finally, giving credit uh, to the author, so receiving credit if I'm an author, and this is something we do. That's the initial part. It's just a part, because this is for software that already exists. For software which is under development, not yet existing, what you need is to actually support the best tools and practices for development, and we have seen some example. You need to help people creating, if, if there is enough uh, uh, cloud there, creating community, maintaining it, it's not an easy thing. You don't learn it just uh, by thinking it in, in an afternoon. And beyond that, you also need policies to encourage this kind of thing. You need sustainability, which is complex. We have seen some examples on legal sustainability, organizational sustainability, technical sustainability, financial sustainability. All these aspects need to be taken into account. Uh, and, and then you have to need to technology transfer, etc., etc. You need tools. So this is a super humbling challenge. Uh, but my point here is that this is a complex challenge which is not just for us in academia, it's a challenge we share with the rest of the world, industry, developer communities, etc. So no one should try to reinvent the wheel or work in a vacuum. We should work together. I mean, open source communities, academics, in, uh, companies, etc. I mean, to, to have a good relationship between open source and industry has taken something like 20 years, maybe. So let's see if we can avoid spending 20 more years integrating the rest of the world. Uh, so now let me give you a little bit of a perspective of implementation from France. So France in 2018 published the first national open science plan, which was very detailed, where software was mentioned cursorily just in the paragraph one line. But in 2021, you had a second iteration of this plan, and the big novelty is that, to the best of my knowledge, I, I, I look at your <laughs> matter system and to the best of my knowledge, this is the only uh, national open science plan that has a fully dedicated chapter focused on software. Okay? The, the title is Opening Up and Promoting Source Code Produced by Research. 
So you can go and see the detailed version. Then we publish an English version of this plan. But in particular, what is interesting here is that one of the council who's left plan is that a special college has been created, the National Committee for Open Science, to try and help implementing this plan. There are 25 colleagues from many different areas, different disciplines, different profiles, professors, researchers, engineers, technology, transfer, legal people, etc., etc. And so we have five action lines of so identifying and highlighting research software production, looking at the technical and social tools and best practices for developing software. Uh, how do you do technology transfer? Or, I mean, uh, translation, as they say in the US today, that is to say not just technology transfer, basically impact in society and sustainability, but for liaison, recognition and careers. Okay. So some of the results are already publicly available. For example, there has been an extensive report on the different technology and issue when you use software forges for developing software in academia. Because some people put everything on guitar for some reason, other people don't put it there, and there are a lot of complex issues that come up. You can look at the records and publish in English. And last but not least, uh, uh, two years ago, we launched a national open science award dedicated to research software, because this is one of the key points. Okay? You need to make software visible, otherwise people will not actually uh, uh, give it give attention to it. And so the, in the 2022 edition, there were over 120 very high quality submissions, four main awards, six successes. Here you have a picture of the Minister of Research website giving one of these awards in a, in a beautiful French setting in, in, in the School of Medicine. Uh, uh, I, I suppose you know at least one of the winners, which is Psychic Claire. I mean, this, this uh, library was developed here in France, of course, they got a, they got an award, but there are many others. And the, the 2023 edition is open, and actually will be, uh, the result will be announced at the end of November. This is institutionalized now, so every year there will be a call like this. Now, this was a little bit about policy, a little bit about how you can try to implement it at the policy level. Now, let me go to something maybe a little bit more concrete in terms of infrastructures. Uh, because I believe that even if it is essential to have institutions at the national level to take responsibility, some things require an international cooperation and a global approach. So let me focus now on two issues, uh, the two of the many issues I have discussed before. Software archive and software reference. Making sure the software you rely upon is available, making sure you can always find the version you were using at a given moment in time. And let me start to, from what we used to do huh, many years ago. When I was younger, I mean, in the 80s, we, we just pushed zip, no, zip was not there yet. I mean, tar files or zip files later on on some FTP servers. There are no longer FTP servers working, not, not many, not many more working now. Uh, then after FTP server, we, we put things on web pages. Uh, then web pages come and go. So somebody had a great idea, say, why don't we put software inside the document archive and put a stick DOI to it? Okay. This was basically an, an old approach of doing this. Then in the 2000, you get software projects, source forge. You remember this first time this thing appeared? It was a game changer. I mean, for all guys like me that use RCS, CDS, having subversion, having sorts of fantastic. Then later on, you get Git and a distributed version control system, you get GitHub, and GitLab, and Bitbuck, and all this kind of stuff around. This is so much better, okay? The software source code is at the core of your work. It is immediately visible. You go to the software forge and you see the source code, okay? That, that's a key point. It actually becomes a, a, a social network for developers is something we didn't see coming at the beginning. Okay? So this is so much better. Uh, and then academia tried to catch up. Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at my own field. Okay? This is from the ACM publication. 
So the ACL push it up something which is called the digital library, they added support for sharing software. How did they do this? You get these badges, I mean, artifact available, etc., etc. Then you get the DOI on the bar, on, 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 on a zip file. And you see that the author is not very happy because in the comment, the author tried to smuggle in the link to the GitHub uh, repository because this is what is important for him about the UI that comes from outside. So basically, I mean, A has gone because this is very poor user experience. C, hmm, we can really do better. And B, why not just doing B? You put your software on GitHub, that's it. Okay. And, and it's ready for everybody. Well, no. The point is that forges are not archived. Okay, so in 2015, we had the first big warning. Okay, well, let me start from the beginning. It's, a forge is not an archive because you, as the author of the project, can remove the project at any time. But it's even worse than that. Forges can disappear. 2015, Google Code and Gitorios went out of service with few, uh, I mean, Gitorios, three weeks notice. Google called uh, one year, okay, but basically one million project disappeared, I including the uh, software link by papers and well. Later on, 2019, we bucket remove a I mean, quarter of a million repository. Last summer, if you remember, GitHub uh, mm, considered removing all projects that were inactive for a year. So, luckily, they changed their mind. The even at the institution at Inria, when we finally moved from the old GForge to the new GitLab, basically all the links were broken and a full build system was, was down for a few days, a time to fix it. So let me say it another way. If you want an archive, you need to look for an archive. Okay, don't, don't expect something which is not an archive to be an archive. Now the good news is that now we have a, a universal archive for source code. And here I changed my head. Now, now I go on to, as, as a director of software. What is software heritage? The well, software heritage initiative which was started in 2015, okay, so eight years ago, to actually fill this hole. So the mission of software heritage, which is a non-profit, international, multi-stakeholder initiative, is to actually go out, collect all the source code of all the software public available, make sure it is not lost, and make it available easily to everybody. So in a nutshell, this is, you can think of it as a kind of a reference catalog. So no, no matter if your software is on GitLab, GitLab, Bitbucket, your own uh, particular forging, your own institution, whatever, it will all be collected here, and you have a single point where you can find a reference of this software. Another way of looking at it, this is really an archive. What comes in stays in. Okay, we have copies of it. At every time we visit something, even if you fiddle with the Git history, you do rebase and push, times, force, etc., etc., you will still find the old history archive if we pass it on your repository earlier than that. And last but not least, I, I have always been surprised by the ability of humankind to pull together and put on the table the energy and resources needed to achieve some big missions. One of my best friends was an Italian, so he moved to Baltimore 30 years ago. He spent 30 years to work on the James Webb Space Telescope. 30 years, 10 billion dollars later, we had a beautiful infrastructure out there to look at the origin of the universe. I'm super admirative, a little bit jealous, and I'm asking, how comes in computer technology, where there is no lack of money, we have not been able up to now to build the very large telescope to explore the galaxy of software development? Okay, so we humbly think the software is the first brick to our support. I'm missing three to four or five zeros huh, in the budget compared to my friend. But we start doing something. So this is an international non-profit initiative. We have an agreement with UNESCO. It is sustained how? Sustainability is a key issue. Basically, we have a membership uh, organization, a few organization. Iria is the founder here in, in France. CEA is our biggest new partner. So thanks a lot for being on board. 
But many, many other organizations around the world, maybe, maybe companies, maybe research institution, the Ministry of Research in France, they put more than they can. Just to tell you that what you are going to see is supposed to be this plan for the long term. It is not a research project that finishes in two years and who knows what happens later on. And so what is this? I mean, this is the largest software kind ever built. It is designed as one infrastructure catering for the need of a multiplicity of users. With UNESCO, we work on rebuilding the history of computing, looking for landmark software, recovering it, archiving it, etc. That's fine. But we also work with industry, they need a platform traceability and, and uh, on the supply, sort of supply chain. Uh, with research, I mean, this is the reason I'm here today, and research on two facets. One is the archive for the software you develop to make sure you always have access to the detection you are interested in but also the instrument to study how software is developed and help you find the best one for your application and public administration. Today, uh, this is number from last week, uh, there are 262 million projects already archived. This is over 16 billion unique source files. Okay? If you stop the same content more than once, we keep it only once. Very easy, computer fashion, it is this too hard. And where does this come from? Uh, of course, GitHub is the biggest fish, but you have Debian, Bitbucket, Git, Geeks, you know, our package manager, over 1,000 different platforms are archived in here. And, can, and how does it address the needs we mentioned before? Well, for archival, what we do, we basically build this huge, gigantic crawler that goes automatically and fetches source code wherever it is found. And it does it in two ways. In the first, we list all these platform. Not easy. Huh? It is not like archiving the web. I mean, we, we have, there is no standard for each event feed is different. We need that up. And once you have the list of all these software objects, we have Git, a version of Google, Tanzip, whatever, we go the extra mile and actually we rebuild all the history of developing it. We embed it in a gigantic global direct acyclic graph that contains the history of the development across the world. It's a gigantic Merkle graph. I mean, think of a Git graph, but the scale of the world. That contains today the full history of software development, permanently archived with all references. And this, if you want some number, all of the software of mankind is more or less 1.5 petabytes. So less than what you get with a single experiment in the large adult collider, I'd say. Uh, but the graph is huge. I mean, 55 billion nodes, 500 billion edges. This is probably the largest publicly available social graph you can find around. It is a graph we all build together when we this development. And what about the reference? You know, each, every single one of these nodes internal in the graph, and for people who know what the metal graph know, uh, the studio, but let me remind it, we have a cryptographic signature, a hash here, which is computed from the content itself. So it does not depend on any registry, okay? If you want, you are interested in a particular version, a piece of source code, you have the hash, you put it in your build, make file, whatever, and you will find it. And, and so you, you can identify contents, directory, revision, releases, uh, snapshot with the standard Merkle contraction. We also have, I mean, uh, extra qualifier that provide the context. This is now part of the SPDX2 certification revenues foundation, the, the, the prefix is registered, there is a corresponding Wikidata property, and there is an international working group for standardizing this uh, identifier, which is open to everybody. Okay, the first version is almost done. I do not have a lot of time, but you know, this allows you to do something like this. In this slide, I added one of these links, and what you will get here is exactly the piece of code from the Apollo 11 source code uh, that I mentioned to you before. You get it immediately through these links here, you see? It's exactly the same sort of hash identifier we have seen before. So you can share it and put it wherever you want. And when you come back, you find the same code in the same context inside the archive. This is actually the archive. Right? This is a software archive. 
if you go back here, you will see that this really looks like a, like a GitHub or GitHub or whatever. Okay? The only difference is that this is really an archive, a software archive. You can visit it inside, you can select fragments, point to whatever you want. And later on, you can say, I want exactly the software as it was in this moment in time. And this is a version I used for my application. So you see, uh, this is the way you use it. So typically, this would be the demo time, but I have to mean it left, so I, I cannot do it. Uh, you will find on these slides, this section is a demo, so you can browse the archive, reference it, you can click on the next step. Uh, maybe just, just show you this, which is important, if I can do it. You see, sometimes it's important to have somebody doing the archive for you, even if you don't know it. This is a guy who did uh, published papers in astrophysics with pointer to software. When Bitback had removed this quarter of a million project, he thought everything was lost because he just put the software there. Okay? And then somebody pointed him to the copy that had already been done on the software that I can, because actually we, we have a copy of Google Copy, Tomorrow's Big Mac, don't worry, a firefighter, we have a doing our job. And he was particularly happy that he didn't lose. Now, let me move forward to the end. So the, you have some adoption indicator from here, you, I will give it for your user later on. But a word for you, for your community. I mean, you're talking about long-term sustainability. There are so many aspects we already mentioned. It. But Geeks is a kind of package manual that has been designed to be able to reproduce and piece of sort of bit by bit from source code and a minimal, minimal executable surface. Right? There is a version which is designed for HPC. And we have been working with the people at Geeks to make sure, because the, the, the way Geeks work is to go fetch a source code from the origin and recompile the thing. What happens if the source code is no longer there? And you depend on those packages which have open source that you do not control. Well, now, every single package which is packaged inside Geeks is archived in software edge, and there is a transparent fallback uh, from uh, Geeks to software edge. So if the original source code has disappeared, they fetch it from our side. I hope it doesn't happen too often because we are not, I mean, our infrastructure is not comparable to the one you have, okay? We don't have uh, your resources for a moment. Now, the way forward, if I can say it very briefly, mutualization of resources, standardization. Okay? So, no matter if you are in industry, in academia, public administration, etc., everybody has this need of archiving a referencing source code. I know, I know the temptation to be each and every one of us our own petty internal archive that archives only our software, the software we believe we depend upon, is strong. Everybody wants to do it. Okay. First of all, it is not ecological, okay? Because we are replicating data structure, data center of this. Second, is probably not the best idea. The best idea would be to federate around one infrastructure that is open share where you have your say, that actually provides the same service to everybody and archives all the software, not just yours, also software from, from other people. You will find them there. And so this is what we are trying to do now, to actually, in, in, in the scholarly ecosystem, we are trying with the European project, etc., to interconnect with the institutional repository, with the editors, publishers, aggregators, etc., to make sure this actually works. We do what we can, okay? I do not have a 70 million euro project. Uh, this is a 1.5 million work package in a European project. But it is very effective, we are doing this kind of thing. And so, if I can finish with the call, I mean, it was very short, I cannot go through everything. Even. But my call is a kind of call to bring together academia, industry, public sector, everybody, to build an infrastructure which is reference, global, open, mutualized for having better software in the future. 
what I have shown to you is a private reference. Okay? But much more than that. Okay? Because what we had, and I'm surprised today already, is archival reference integrity. We are working on this area, from this kind of side of this. But the next step is the global software knowledge base, and actually massive analysis of this source code. Imagine you have 260 million and counting projects, not just GitHub, those sort of things. If stuff which is very old, written in another language, with modern technology, like AI, etc., what can we do to actually better structure this part of our human knowledge and to use it properly? So we seek so as a kind of a catalyzer for this big uh, undertaking. If you want to join in this kind of um, undertaking, uh, please do not hesitate. Come talk to me during the, the breakfast. I will stay here for a while before it's getting a bit and very easy to reach. And uh, I think I have used up my time. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Could you comment uh, about the reasoning uh, behind just basically archiving everything when, when we know like, um, a healthy project uh, you know, has a lot of developers that clone for the software and the amount of garbage that there is that's generated that doesn't even compile that you will be archiving is probably insane, right? I mean, I, mean I, I suppose you've been thinking that maybe you can't curate and select what needs to be archived and you decide to do everything, but what's your reasoning? Oh, okay, v very good question. I mean, this is a key question you ask yourself when you're building a, a traditional archive, you have a curation process, you decide what can be archived or not. So if I go to the National French Library with, with the scrapbook of mine and telling them they need to keep it, they probably say no, right? Uh, the point is that when you look at software, there are two reasons why we decide to do this. One is a technical reason. There is no technical limitation. I tried everything because, for example, if there are thousands of forks of the Linux kernel, by the way this Merkle structure is built, we only keep one. Okay, we stop, we, we, we see the forks. They have the same hash up to a point. The only thing we store is the difference, and this is really not much. But you would say, okay, even if it is not a technical issue, why do you want to keep all that crap? So now comes the second uh, part of it. The point is that uh, you need to make a choice between taking the risk of storing something which is useless against taking the risk of storing of losing something which is meaningless, meaningful. Sorry, you remember my English is not very. The point is that when I was a student, still a student, 1995, actually no, I was already an associate professor. 1995, I remember seeing this message on the Usenet by uh, Rasmus Lerdov, who was a creator of PHP, saying, hey, I'm fed up of writing my HTML pages by hand. I can map over the weekend with a crappy thing that they call personal home page tools uh, thing. It's free. You can take it, do whatever you want. Imagine you are a curator for an archive in that month, and you see passing something like this. What do you do? You throw it away, right? No, I mean, it has become one of the most popular languages for the web, which is not necessarily a good thing, I agree. But we need to keep the history. So remember, so is a new kind of archive. Being in the archive is not a guarantee of quality. It's just a guarantee of accessibility. Now, the curation comes after. How does the curation come after? by portals, academic portals, community portals, etc., they point into the archive and say, the part which is in the portal for us is this one. By massively studying the content and seeing what is reused, what is maintained, all this kind of information is already there because we have the graph of development. You can do a lot of things on top of this, but we are not able to do it beforehand, at least not yet. I hope this answers the question. Um, I didn't see, maybe you mentioned it earlier, I missed it, but I did not see whether you were attempting to capture the software dependencies of the large software packages, without which, uh, you know, I mean, if you imagine, for example, trying to rebuild NCSA, 
even though you have all the software. Uh, you know, there were some versions that ran on some Spark stations, or some on, on DEC alphas, on, on, on Linux boxes and Windows, which were all effectively different pieces of software, and none of which you could build today without a major research effort to reconstruct the entire software infrastructure in which those actors live. So there's an extent to which the software, yes, you have, this, you have the source code. If you're a clever computer scientist, you can read it and infer what it means, but you can't, it's dead. You can't make it come alive and do anything that you want. So how, I mean, how does one accomplish the recreation of the, of the software environment that these packages live in? Yeah, that, that's a very important question too. So they, that was one, I mean, if you look back, there is a paper we published in 2017, actually in a community which is different from this and from mine, which is a digital preservation community, where we stated our principles, what, what we plan to do and why we take this decision. And this was one of the major questions too. So should we only focus on the source code or should we also go the extra mile to try and see how it can be a real bit? The decision we took back then was to focus only on the source code because it was the only blind spot in the large group of initiatives you can find around. So there are many initiatives to maintain virtual machines based on own system, rebuilding things, etc. No one is super general, super... Uh, I do not see any clear winner. Okay? And so we decided to focus on what we know how to do, which is a source code. But of course, we are interested in rebuilding. If you see the energy we spent with the people in the Geeks community, uh, uh, and Nix, uh, both of them, the, the Geeks community, is actually trying to connect with other projects that maintain the rebuildability. Then, if you want to rebuild something which is very, very old, this is the other part we are trying to do with, uh, with UNESCO, but not our sector as a team, providing guidelines and tools, etc., for people to do that. It is much more expensive than just storing the source code. Is there any other question? Uh, Maybe everybody wants to get the coffee. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned that you have uh, some uh, relation with industry, and uh, I think for industry, uh, this kind of uh, software heritage tools and archive for software is very interesting. But uh, the question is, if this software heritage is only dedicated to open source, or you can manage non-open source uh, software? Another very, very important question. You, you see, it is software heritage. It is not open source software heritage or free software heritage. So the long term ambition is actually to create an all encompassing archive of all the source code. And actually, if you look, uh, uh, if you really want to do that, there are two dimensions that come into play. One is technical, and the other is legal. Technical is, is the software source code we want to archive, is it accessible, or is it online or is it offline? Typically, legacy software, like the one you mentioned, is offline, somewhere in a printout, or an old floppy disk, or whatever, 8 inch, 5 and 4 inch, or 3 inches of floppy disk. And then the legal is, do I need to talk to a lawyer or not to get access to this? And so if you put this on a, on a um, you get four quadrants, so our 99% of our energy has been put on, on the open online. We are moving slowly to the offline, open and offline closed, I'm talking with museums and people watching. And the idea for having the online closed would be to provide for companies a, a, a unified, high quality software escort service where they actually can maintain the open source, the closed source software while it is still private. But this is a big interface because it is not just technical, eh? so you, you need to, to work on the legal part, etc. But again, having the same technology, you can imagine what could happen for a company. You could have your own internal vision of your software plus the global vision of everything which is outside in the same kind of infrastructure. And again, I didn't have time to, to give you a demo, but there are mind-blowing potential technology and application under the hood on what you can do with this kind of graph. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can thank again Roberto for the So now it's uh, break time and we'll
start again. Uh, I don't know. Any systems engineer, system researcher, yeah, or person outside of Tori. Today, uh, so I mainly work on telemetry data, data analytics, about data models, applications of machine learning, towards NLP efficiency. Um, today, I'll be talking about HPC energy efficiency. This is a long title, but in short, HPC energy efficiency towards sustainable, sustainable efficiency. And this is a new initiative uh, supported by my management, my Faye, Regina, everybody here, and also uh, influenced by many collaborators I have in AEA species working group, like European and Asian things. So I hope um, we can kind of have this topic. <coughs> so sustainability. Like saving Earth from climate change, um, carbon emissions, accountability, uh, being responsible, thinking about the legacy to our next generations. You know, I think these are the topics I'm trying to talk about while describing this discussion around efficiency and efficiency. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, strictly speaking, carbon emission and energy efficiency is not directly connected at all. Um, it's just, it's a very, there are many much more supply issues and the electricity contract issues that, that accounts for um, energy, the carbon emissions and climate change. But, you know, unless we come up with a better solution, the energy footprint we're going to have is definitely going to be accounted for, and that's where we want to um, be effective. And also, HPC has this interesting um, effect to the entire industry, like just like the F1 racing towards the automobile industry, even with we're niche, um, the impact we can make can be like propagated to the entire industry, so that's quite meaningful. So whatever we do, it's quite effective. The second thing here I'm talk talking about is energy efficiency itself. Now, I said new initiative, but energy efficiency has been talked about more than a decade towards the scale. Now, what is different? So today, I'm trying to be a little more informi informative, like around like, why it's different and how we are trying to get there. So energy efficiency really has many different bases. And in terms of supporting that energy efficiency goals, I'm trying to share what we're doing, what we're headed towards, what we're thinking, and how we're gonna get there. But the keyword is data-driven, that's one keyword, application level, HPC energy efficiency. So HPC energy efficiency, uh, which energy efficiency are we talking about? Um, in answering this question, I think uh, it was it's really helpful to um, like you know really dissect the metrics we commonly use, and one being the PUE, power usage effectiveness. Now this is the floor plan of the summit supercomputer, our predecessor. Uh, I should change this to our new computer. This is what I have right now. Uh, PUE is a metric that's calculated with the energy consumption or power consumption of the entire data center, including the compute and the power and the compute, the facility, cooling. Over the uh, over the compute you have, so the compute is the good put you have, and the the like, cooling is the over you have. So this is designed in a way that if you're recording 1.0, you're very effective, and everything above is not effective. And um, if you further break it down, you'll identify there are multiple components in these kind of metrics. So if you look into the power for compute. There is this idle power um, that happens just by turning this computer on, and there's this dynamic power that is determined by the application activity solely, like driving the GPU or driving the CPU. And then we have uh, the facility uh, power consumption, which can be many things, but one of the most important things is the cooling. So the 13 megawatt goes into a two tennis ball court, and you have to really get the heat out of that very efficiently. And if you calculate the power consumption over time, it's the rate of energy consumed over time. Um, you can come up with the energy consumption in a unit amount of time and plug it into the equation you have up there. And you can kind of notice that you can get things like 1.03, 1.1. And 1.1 means 10% of your energy is used for cooling. Now, is this the right metric you want to look into? Now, I think you'll start to notice this, this is Kind of, this metric is kind of driven by a specific purpose, optimizing the cooling, not the energy consumption of the compute itself. So the 1.0, which is the red part, is the entire dynamic energy, but the focus is really minimizing the 0.03, or 0.1, which is not necessarily 
what we want towards going to the process scale energy efficiency. So, um, what will be the alternative I'm trying to talk about today? Um, energy efficiency is, efficient, is an efficiency metric, and it has to be a uh, metric that is really studying the relationship between the work you've achieved and the cost you spent. So it's mainly useful work over total energy, and what you want to do is maximize the work you've achieved while minimizing the cost you have spent, minimizing like total energy as a consumer. Um, now, useful work might be controversial. You can think about this as flops, throughput, with any, any other things. But in general, I think this is just to express the idea by no means this is the final metric. I think yesterday, NVIDIA that was like, uh, you know, showed a very interesting metric talking about the solution, uh, time to solution and energy to solution, and at the same time, and being able to formulate like objective functions. Uh, this is really trying to like bootstrap those kind of discussions. We need some kind of those kind of things. I hope you get the idea. So, with that dynamic power, idle power, um, cooling plant power uh, in, in mind, if I throw a few more uh, concepts, I think you're going to get the better picture of what energy efficiency means in HPC. So one concept is the impact of decisions you make in the life cycle of supercomputing procurement and the whole entire life cycle. So vastly simplified, you have the design and deploy time you, that you in the procurement. You write the RFP, um, you engage the vendors, um, you design the system, you deploy, you deploy it, tune it, and then you open it to the users. And then with the flip of a switch, it turns into an operational endeavor going towards it. And there's there are many decisions made along the way. And um, here, um, you can, the circles are the impact of the decision towards, uh, towards the energy efficiency um, aspect of HPC. So, um, for example, the idle power is really determined by the system hardware you purchase and the technology in terms of silicon manufacturing you completely rely on. And it happens at the deploy time, but not but it doesn't really impact anything. You can do nothing because well, you already bought it, and that's the machine you're gonna live with for five years along the way. So in operations time, well it's, you really don't have that much impact there. And that's pretty much the same for cooling as well. In operation time, uh, most of the time it's the um, dynamic power, and there's a reason why I put it in the red, and the reason why it's the, the circle is really, really large, because it's kind of an untapped source of energy that we have never really tapped in for, at least for in our case. Um, so that's the way how it looks like right now. The other concept is the four pillars of energy efficiency, um, which is, I think it's worth coined by LRZ, their source of the model, my collaborator. I think he's in HP right now. So it really reflects the um, HPC data center stack in terms of the specialty of people around actually operating and building these systems and the, their operational domains and how they impact which part of the design process or which part of the operational process. So building infrastructure is the cooling facility engineer with the hard hats moving around daily, looking at the pipes, quality and all those things. System hardware, um, the hardware designers, our system architecture designers who really try to design the right system by the most power efficient system, that's the people. And system software is really like slur, the resource managers, and the scheduling policy, those kind of things. And sometimes it might include the runtime to the middleware um, that mainly do energy efficient operations. And then we have the application developers using all of those things and carrying out science. So with this uh, matrix in mind, I think you can start to see what it meant to be achieving a um, excess scale system, an excess scale system. So the focus is really on having a power efficient system because there was this 20 megawatt artificial um, boundary that we have to put ourselves in because of the uh, entire capex and optics in, uh, in a more realistic sense. So. Um, so for that reason, we had to do really achieve a by the power efficient system that led us to achieve a very good um, flops per watts metric in degree 500. And also in the building infrastructure side, we've been employing things like economizers, 
you know, heat, the, the water supply economizers to really um, cut down our cooling costs to achieve um, PUV at like one point more or even less. And this kind of differs from um, the circumstances of other sites or other computing um, facilities in other pl uh, places in the world. Um, it is mainly due to the circumstances we have. We didn't have the like, restraint of the power consumption um, in an extreme sense, but there are other um, sites that went into other directions, optimizing system software, middleware, and application, and all those things. Um, and this is something I'm trying to really um, tap into. So this um, design time, operation time, and system hardware, uh, the building process, and the application side, that kind of makes these um, stark difference between like what it has been for um, ACC energy efficiency for a pre the pre asset scale era. But now it's a post asset scale, and it's going to be very different. I think you're going to naturally see, I'm going to talk about this red gigantic uh, untapped area, which is again up in the application level and in the life cycle of the operations. And this is significantly different from um, what we used to think about energy efficiency, at least in our sites. Um, now, the name of the game of exascale, the having an exascale machine was really find the most power efficient system and really collaborating with the hardware vendors. And in this case, the um, exascale achievement, I think, must have been the drive towards buying or developing um, hardware devices, compute devices that can really fulfill our performance needs. But moving forward, uh, the optimization of the energy efficiency in the application level and the operation level really has to be, the name of the game is continuous improvement. So you have to measure, make a good decision, and actually impact it, the two, two of the control knobs, and then you will be able to save energy. That is significantly different. In this case, telemetry data, so, so I'm going to talk about the keyword data driven. So telemetry data serves as a key role. We have to, in this whole, uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so we ran out of energy. Um, this is what we're um, afraid of, actually. So data is something that powers all these decisions. It powers the um, decisions, like the profiling tools, the, the guidance tools, the, the, the like job optimizations, and all those things. Without data, you can't do pretty much anything in this area. So it's really important. And then, the other important part is, if you make a smart decision, you need to be able to control things. So these control nodes have to be in your control. And in this case, I, I think we're talking about the applications, and uh, this book will talk about how to do that, and what we're thinking getting there. So, this whole picture kind of depicts, uh, the kind of like renders like how we have been doing things, and wh what we have not been doing and so far. So, uh, over the course of the prior generation system and our current generation system, uh, the building infrastructure operation has been really on a really, on a really uh, top notch like, situation. So they meticulously monitor the entire HPC stack just to come up with the right um, cooling parameters that really controls, drives the cooling towers up and down, the cooling pumps up and down. And because this is the whole, whole thing is dynamic, it really is defined by the workload itself. It's really a complex operation, but they're doing a pretty good job. But because of the lack of interest in the operation, because we just bought the power efficient system, and we're not going to impose any kind of burden to the scientific output, uh, everything above is kind of like left um, side. And which is actually a good thing. You don't really want to introduce any operational complexities in this manner. But, I, but the realization here is that might change moving forward. Um, so the, after it's a scale, we're not going to be able to achieve the necessary speed ups uh, within the power budget we have. And that's kind of problematic. And if you look at the technologies on the horizon, unless uh, the vendors come up with something interesting, like, you know, Scotty, more power, Star Trek, um, you know, it's going to be very difficult. So 
Um, definitely, there, at some point, the applications will definitely have to have, and these energy efficiency concerns will be bleeding off from the system hardware and going into the application domain. And like it or not, I think we have to think about that. And this is a realization we have um, to come up with this new initiative and think about how to go about it. So our approach is cumulative. So what we have been doing so far, like buying the power efficient system and maintaining the energy efficient system, that has to be continued. So we're going to continue that. There's more to talk about that though. But the new initiative is potentially focusing on the application and empowering the application users to do more power efficient or energy efficient behaviors. Especially with the, and provide them the tools necessary and the control amounts necessary to actually achieve, maximize the impact of that. And that would mean like really addressing the red dots here and really like enable the people who are in control and it results in giving the right data tools um, and write the control knobs. And it effectively also doing um, official accounting so we can um, let them enable them with proving grounds and start to develop, think about policies and incentives moving forward. Okay, time check. So, but you know, the, here the decision, so, so I say I'm going to, we're going to enable or empower the application users, but what can they do? And here I think one important concept to think about is the concept called race to halt. In other words, rush, rush to halt, uh, which means, in RTH in short, which means finishing the compute early consumes the least amount of energy. Especially this is true for um, capability machines like Summit and Frontier, and this has to do with the fixed cost of uh, flops. The energy consumption of these machines are not proportional. There is a certain cost to the static consumption, and then it goes dynamic, and that really accounts to many types of efficiencies. And, uh, we can kind of see that from the, our, the, the power envelopes you see from our Summit supercomputer. Um, now, if you turn on the system, it's instantly 2.5 megawatts just by turning the machine on. If you're allocated right, you're sitting at 2.5 megawatts. You have to do something. And if you're not using energy, um, you're wasting not only node hours, you're wasting energy as well. Actually, this is a very good thing. I mean, like, research-wise, challenge-wise, we all look for challenges. So novelty-wise, it's not that novel, but operationally, realistically, this is really good. Because um, everybody talks about carbon neutrality, uh, carbon emission, energy efficiency, but the thing you need to do is what you, what you used to do, like making your application run really, really fast. But I think there are additional um, opportunities if you have the data in hand um, and if you're aware of what you're using, there are certain things you can do. Um, and we did some thought experiments, and it goes something like this. So one aspect is coming from the efficiency curve, the actual gain, which is a parallelism, and the ideal gain. And what do you want to, how many components do you want to allocate to your job? Obviously, it's going to be this optimal point here. You don't want to over um, allocate or under allocate because. Um, this is a this is kind of this efficiency curve you have here. The more energy you use, the, the more nodes you allocate, the more energy you're going to burn. The less nodes you're going to use, the longer it will run. So it's the more energy you're going to burn again. So there has to be there is a maximum point there. But this is not really a snapshot kind of thing. If you, you have to look at consider the entire job, the duration of the job, and think about where the critical section is and really distributing the work here. And especially in this red line, you have to rush to completion. But due to the limitations of, you have to do I.O., you have to do communications, you have to load data, you have to do like, ingress data, there are always nodes that are like slacking off. Like, you know, internal to a job, there's always a barrier or this artificial deadline you can kind of leverage. And think about like talking them down if you can't really like possibly allocate that. And even worse, um, if you're kind of doing this reduction all the way down to a certain level, then there might be like idle nodes going, like, you know, bugging you. So just one strategy might be just like deallocating them and um, make them somebody else's responsibility. So these are kind of the basic um, strategies I think we can do in terms in a RTH system. So I go, go a little bit deeper 
Rush means you make it run faster, and this means not only optimizing the software, making the like, conscious choice choices to like make your code run on the most efficient device, the accelerator. Or you know, as an investment, you can buy the accelerator to actually rush this thing. And it doesn't mean um, not only the compute. If you're memory bound, you should like invest in memory bound, um, or like at least allocate the task on memory percent location, and things like that. The idle nodes, which you can't really possibly drive it hard, you can actually talk it down, and this will add up um, if this is significant. And then turning it off and returning resources back into the queue is probably one of the things you can like sensibly do. And combine all these things, you can kind of develop, try to start to develop the strategy along the optimal Pareto, Pareto front frontier and think about like trying where to go moving forward. So in all these operations, I told about I talked about um, data. Data, 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 and it has to do it it it, it. it it touches the topic of instrumentation of the computer system. So, what do we do currently, and what we're going to do in the future to um, help these operations, this continuous encrypted loop? Because data is the power, the fuel that really makes that going. So, currently, we have a comprehensive monitoring um, activity going on, and the super, and the sub supercomputer, and it's the same thing, pretty much the same thing in the on um, the uh, frontier supercomputer. It's, it's all the way down to the component level. Um, and we do that into the all nodes on the back, and every node in every single node in the on compute floor. And then um, we contextualize that afterwards uh, with the job scheduler allocation log. So um, the the data instantly it's not only a simple like power and energy and uh, thermal uh, data. It gets a job contest and instantly gets alive and it gets relevant. So the graphs you saw with the, um, the second one was the HPL workload, and the third one was the machine learning node. And that, based on that understanding, you can start to understand what the data feature looks like, and there are pros and information there. So these are powered by um, um, the, data, the data center instrumentation methods really um, develop by the collaboration with the vendors, engagement with the vendors. They are the ones provided, but we have to provide the feedback to provide us the right tools and the right sensors. And currently, the main um, two ways of monitoring this with the same set of hardware components in the middle, um, one way is collecting this is out of band from the vantage point of the baseboard management controllers. And the other way of monitoring this is traditionally used like you spawn a daemon inside the CPU alongside your application. And there's these trade-offs um, according to the amount of overhead you can induce to the system. And this actually shapes the portfolio of what kind of data we provide to the system. Um, so out-of-band data is very um, non-intrusive. There's sitting outside, there's an embedded ARM processor outside of your CPU and collects data, but there's a very minimal flexibility there, and we can go coarse grain. But we, we as a site, found it's extremely useful to have, and we're currently doing this in what, one hertz um, um, granularity, and eventually that turns out to be a big data set. And later, like you know, on one part, it's, it's powering the dashboards in real time, and the other part is archived for our further analysis to like chart its steps. But uh, that is not quite enough. The application information is not visible to the the uh, out of band side, so in band is equally important. But there is a certain overhead to it, so it has to be careful. Um, and by the way, the reason why we talk about this is because this is efficiency, power, and the like, application performance has to go side by side, and only by then you have an efficiency metric. You really have to study that relationship. So in our center, there's not, there were only two ways of doing this, and there's a huge gap. So um, traditionally, there has been a lot of profiling tools that people can use, but it's high overhead, like wealth of information, but high overhead. So it's not really um, something that can deploy and really understand the impact in the, in, as the system goes. And at the end of the day, you're going to have just one accounting number coming from slur and things like that, and how to deal with it. So we found. There are two capabilities we're currently uh, developing and deploying. One being 
Um, the always on power and energy analytic service that leverages the out of band data collection. And the other is the application performance monitoring, which is really opt in based. We don't really like globally collect this, but we opt let the user enable us to do like monitoring as well. And the whole idea is to have this lineage of like workflow across this whole stack of um, data sets you can collect from the uh, supercomputer. So if I talk a little bit of our current uh, power and energy analytics service, the main purpose is to increase the um, data and model usage for our center. It not only includes the workflow, but also includes the use case for the system management and also the facility engineer. So data comes in from the entire facility, goes through a data distribution mechanism, and we use Spark to do joins and aggregations. And those to an in-house made uh, user interface that covers three use cases in general. Um, one is the per-application profile, which is going to be the most relevant thing to this discussion right now. And then we have the system hardware that really concerns about like the stability of the system. And also uh, central management control analysis and like machine learning optimization, subjective functions, those things are also on the other side as well. So this is mainly for staff only, not really user based, and there are the plans to get there. But on the other hand, there's a user side component where we um, try to employ the application performance monitoring concept. So it's a course way, but we're trying to do this opt-in. So the idea is to just ask for the user to let us in by adding just two lines, like load something and just finalize something. And then we'll just drop a data set that is much, much relevant to you and we'll print it out. And not only that, we're going to make you enable that you utilize that data through the UI you set as an additional layer so you can actually study those things. That's kind of the way how we envision. And if you combine everything together, no, sorry, before I combine everything, um, the in-band stuff is really around um, uh, the resource utilization of the like, sub-component level artifacts, like the DRAM bandwidth, engine activity, so for example, you're running an LLN, which automatic engine are you triggering, and things like that. And this initial version was uh, from NVIDIA, or Summit, and uh, DCGM. It was the, the hardware counter based thing, but the overhead was just counted for only 1% for the running job, really buried down into the, um, the noise. And we are engaging this into like enable studies to enable um, the kind of studies that really study the relationship between again the resource usage, power, the performance, and the power and energy consumed related to that. So I hope you can see this lineage of entire um, the coverage, but like our workarounds to getting around the corners of the reality of data collection of the, of the system. Um, but at the end of the day, you have an energy number, and you can go all the way back to um, the profiling session with having the monitoring people in between. So if you're, something goes wrong with the monitoring, the next thing you would do, you would try to profile it, and then you all the way go down to your like really deep down one node profiling session, it can make this continuous iteration go on and on. And which will eventually, I hope, that can maximize our user's ability to um, save energy. So, almost there. So, in summary, um, I talked about post exascale energy efficiency, that is gonna, that's, which is different from exascale energy efficiency, the way how we got here. And we are thinking about like how to like support the users so that they can let's, like really you know pick those low hanging fruits, the behavior opportunities. But that's not we can really start the um, continuous loop involved in this whole operation. And, um, and as the first step of the activities of, in, in continuum of our current effort towards time data monitoring, we are filling the workflow gap of this continuous loop and trying to enable our users um, to say, like, to have their, have, like, the activity of saving energy into their day-to-day -day lives. But this is still a long way to go. There are many questions, I think there are many obvious questions. I, I think I could see it in your faces, like, what, why, how? 
So, you know, you know one thing, so these, there are many, many research questions. So, I talked about behavioral options, like four ways of doing this, but there are many, many more. There's no means um, exhaustive. And that has to be explored. Like, how can we enable the users to do that? And the vendor support is also very, very important. The capability actually comes from these devices, and there has to be some code design and interaction um, and using those things. And like end of the day, these things have to be like um, automated. But you may ask, oh, this is all research. This is like you know has been there for a very long time. But my point is, um, the reason why I talked about this noble cause of like saving the earth and things like that is because we need participation. So a conscious decisions to actually save energy. And without that, uh, as a systems engineer, you expose these neat interfaces, but end of the day you realize, oh, nobody's using it. But this may be different um, if you talk about things, and that's what we're aiming for. Which really goes down to the road of how do we um, change human behavior? What's the incentive of getting there? And I think we talked about open science. We talked about like a lot of things, but then how, all goes down to human behavior. What's the incentive? And this is where I think I'm asking to the community to think about how to go about this. What's the best way? And how, if we are trying to be responsible in terms of uses of HTC energy, how should we do it? And uh, in some part, I think metrics is one of the things that we need to really think about. So we were thinking about one metric so far, performance, and all period. But there's another axis called um, energy efficiency. And the future there will be another like, like carbon emission. And the future there will be more coming down. And you can already see this as a very complex problem. So um, designing this and thinking about what this looks like, I think is a key to think about when developing, the first step towards developing a policy or a way to really, you know, go towards energy efficiency in general. So with that, uh, asking for action, thank you for your time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's a very good point. So there's a reason why we're going towards opt-in. So um, turns out monitoring application performance is not, it's, it, can, it can be, you can, the number of things you can think of is having it be global, but the application monitoring capability actually incurs some level of overhead, and there are users who don't want that, who don't really care about at this point. So um, that's the reason we want to have that optionally. But at the end of the day, yes, we want to have this accounted as a default setting, and that will definitely be in the prologue, in the epilogue, um, and it could be like applied to many things. But there's definitely a benefit of being this optional, because sometimes the monitoring metric per job can be different. Some, some people need more resolution, some people need less resolution, some people need a specific area of interest, and all those things, and uh, this is one of the ways to achieve that kind of flexibility, so we thought this was the most reasonable thing to do at this point of time. It may change, yes, definitely true. Yeah, uh, from my opinion, what implements the same thing. Uh, it's best to uh, put that by default and to let the user deactivate. Yes, that's absolutely possible, yes. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah, there are steps, uh, baby steps, yes. Uh, I think we have a talk. In the, um, to save the energy in the lesson, um, so user cooperation is very really important. So as you mentioned in last slide, so it, it, it will be feasible. But the, so if you have any idea or thought uh, that incentivize. Um, I see. So actually, uh, if we can write from your so uh, actually I do know that Rikin has this incentive program, and um, I think that's a very great way to go about it. And for the audience, um, Rikin, they have an interesting policy where if you are able to prove you're saving energy, you have this priority boosting or a scheduling policy. So if you're really crunching down time, you kind of like 
add up that policy there and then really use that when you, when you need when you need it. And I and, and I heard from you and like Katie and the Satoshi, they all the users are really cooperative in that sense. So that gave me a little a bit of hope that oh this might be possible. And so I said it's only if we can kind of design this in a very correct way. And I heard the same thing for like, LRZ. So LRZ has a system called EAR, I believe, and that is a only preload based thing which can kind of break your application if you're not careful about it. But it is the only way to access the boost frequency. Um, and by, by default, just everybody was just using it because they need the boost frequency to go full about it. So I think those are really great um, use cases I saw from the field, like talking with everybody. And I think I, I'm personally hoping to see more of these escape use cases and like learn from like how that actually look like and what can we employ and how to how that look like for going forward to really change my behavior. Thank you. Um, to, connecting to to what what you were just saying, I, I think another possible way of going into motivating people to to pay attention to energy efficiency could be, but, but it's something that as a as a system you cannot take that decision, but as a, as a site you could give um, let's say a base computer allocation and then just increase it or decrease it depending on how energy efficient you are or what what are you doing to actually. Um, uh, what to prove that you're actually taking services. And so that is something that probably could motivate more people. I think the, the priority boost is also a very good idea. Um, but I, I think it's very interesting on hearing. Uh, if, if anybody comes to you, I want to be part of that uh, black conversation. I think it's very interesting to, um, to think of ways of, of uh, engaging this with that. I think designing these kind of policies requires certain kinds of skills uh, that, that goes beyond like like me as a computer systems researcher to make more math, more economic design, these kind of things. And I think it's definitely going to be a community different. So let's talk. Yeah. Uh, maybe another another point um, that we should discuss about it is that you show the data you have collected from the job. Uh, we're doing also very, very similar. Um, I would be interested in seeing what, what you are, how you are Presenting those results or those, those, those measurements to the users. I think that's something that probably you can, uh, both sides can ask and share. So I think that would be very interesting to see what you're showing and you can see what you're doing. Awesome. We'll be chatting. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much, Jess. Now, the example of the stuff. I have a number of asking to your summer. Defiant. So to reduce such a system of the fixed. Uh, power also. Yes. In that case, uh, maybe we have to think about some geomics and uh, some reduction in the dynamic change in the system. And how do you, uh, do you have any idea such kind of system control? So I'm actually very glad to you mentioned that. So um, one of the so in an RTX system, the uh, rush to power system, uh, the, the the one number one thing you want to do is you to, uh, increase the system utilization per node utilization. And currently, our center is using a per node like isolated dedicated allocation model, but that may change if you want to go as aggressive. And that's I think it's a very good option um, to really think about uh, if you want to go that aggressive. So like, having a set of pools that really has this mixed workload, like the cloud has, they have like very low cost nodes that have like shared thing, but you didn't have the dedicated nodes for like, optimal performance and things like that. So I think those are interesting things to think about. Um, really saving energy. Thank you for mentioning that. So oh, thank you very much. Situation uh, on the top, it's like, okay. And uh, one example is uh, a win-win. Okay, so this one is a win-win. You modify something, you have better uh, time, you have better energy. So it's the case with uh, vectorization. So when you're using uh, a base uh, 512, and so we measure. So that way it's interesting to measure is to know what is the number. Uh, so you have uh, the time is divided by two, and uh, we save energy uh, minus forty percent. And in the second case, uh, we save in energy, but we lose a bit in time. Okay, so it's up to you to know if it's interesting or not. And we are back on the, uh, human behavior. What do you want? You have some elements you can decide. 
Uh, just to explain this case is um, is about um, MPI, MPI active pooling. Okay, when you are writing with API, MPI is pooling very, very, very uh, often. So you consume a lot, a lot of energy. And so for for ex some ex ex some examples, you can introduce uh, some microslip uh, inside your MPI weight. Uh, and so it, of course it's in case of applications when uh, you are waiting for data. In fact, right? But you can, in this case, you will have, um, you will save uh, minus 22% uh, percent of energy and you will uh, waste only 2% percent in time, right? So this is two, two examples. Um, the third example is to give you some element to decide. So uh, it's about a, an application and uh, about parallelization of application. Okay. The application is running on two nodes, four nodes, and so on. And two, in this case, uh, 16 nodes. So the blue line is uh, some kind of speed up. So usually you, you will use uh, the reverse. Uh, but okay. So you have uh, duration of the application and number of, of, uh, of servers, of, of course. You always win some time, but uh, when you have lots of servers, uh, you win S and S. Okay. Uh, on the right is energy, and uh, for uh, the same uh, horizontal line for the number of servers, and when we when we, we can win is it's almost linear. Okay. So when you use uh, these both elements, uh, you are you can project uh, the energy. Uh, in an x uh, axis and then the time, the duration in the x, uh, sorry, yeah, y axis and x, x axis. And so the, the question is, okay, I'm, I, I know that now my application is, uh, for instance, uh, 500 seconds duration, and what is the amount of energy I will consume to go from 400 to, to, to 300, okay, to win some uh, 100 uh, seconds. And so, because we are measured the uh, energy, we are able to know what is the amount of energy we consume. And so, it's up to you to know if it's worth or not. It will depend on the application, it will depend on the facilities, it will depend on lots of things. But we have the, you have the element. Okay, so Energy Scopium is a software developed by Denergium, and I will give you some outputs of uh, the software. And uh, on the upper uh, part, you have some global elements. So the first uh, dashboard is about the jobs. So it, it's all the jobs we are uh, being launched on the, on the facility. And on the right is the server behavior. So you have, it, you know, if the server is a uh, load and uh, if it is efficient. And, and on, the, um, on the bottom, you will have uh, for one job, what is the kind of uh, uh, information uh, is sent to the user, okay? And it will depend on, on the kind of user, it, it's what you say, in fact. So you, here you have, um, I said the mathematician, but I don't want to, <laughs> to have problem, <laughs> okay? But he, he just want to know, okay, if my application is uh, is good, is not good in terms of energy, um, I could perhaps do it better, or it's not necessary. Okay, so you have a label. Okay, right. Then you can go a bit in details, and you have some profile. So you can go, or you can say, okay, ah, okay, I, I'm reading the data, and then uh, um, and in the computation, you save data, and you can zoom off it. Uh, and then you can zoom and you, s you see the internal um, iteration of, uh, of your program. And then at the end, you have the full data, in fact. It's an open format, and we have all the data by processor, by GPUs. And if you, if you ask for, uh, for instance, for temperature for, for internet technology, you will have also all the temperature. And so you can do your own analysis, and you can, use, you can pick up some element for instance, to integrate it in your uh, continuous integration process when you want to have test to or benchmark your uh, energy. So back to the energy chain of, uh, of data centers. So um, currently we are focusing on, on this part, 
as I said. But in fact, data are collected for every part of it. But, um, so I could be interested in question with you, but in fact, it's, it's a mess to get this data. It's a mess because it's not the same domain, uh, it's not the same uh, people, and so uh, it's very difficult to have uh, this kind of data. And um, if, if we could, or if we are, okay, uh, just just a small uh, element about Blogspot. I don't know if all people are, are uh, uh, knowing this, this kind of representation. It's just a representation for statistic uh, data. So you have a, a, a box with a median and a value. Okay. And, um, so if we could have all the element, uh, okay, we could have this kind of uh, of uh, representation. So where you have an application, uh, why are, you, are we using this? You know that um, every everyone knows that uh, when you run twice the same application, you don't have the same time, you don't have the same energy, you don't have okay because there's I/O because there, so you have a, a statistic uh, distribution of. It. It's the same for a cooling system. It's the same for the YC reuse if you have is the same for if you inject some, some on power. Okay? So at the end, what we could have in is fact is to have a PUE, PUE, sorry, for our usage effectiveness as a function of time. And if we have some measurement of the global system, we can improve it. So we can have a global optimization. And I think that it's the goal uh, at what you said before. Uh, it could be a big challenge, but uh, it could be nice to, to have this uh, in a in, in few words, a few years. Thank you a lot. Um, so if you want to discuss, I have lots of cards. <laughs> How is the energy efficiency label calculated? Ah, okay. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, we define energy efficiency. Uh, okay, I, if you want to, to have um, the global uh, challenge for a guy doing the application, if I want to have the same data input, the same data output, my, my, my calculation, and then to minimize the energy consumed to do this. But that means that it's an iterative system and so on. So we have to define some elements to, to say people how far it is to something which could be better. So we define the energy efficiency as uh, the energy consumed divided by the TDP. So the, the maximum you can use from uh, CPU uh, or uh, GPU um, in a normal, in a nominal uh, use, right? It's not a goal itself, okay? For instance, uh, you can add some um, some computation, which has nothing to do with your application, and you will have, we have a better uh, level. So take care with this level. But generally, what what we are what we are um, uh, what we uh, as it is when you have a lab uh, grade which is under um, what well, it's in the red part right under 20 percent it's you have something to do really if you are uh, above uh, 70 percent it's generally that uh, uh, you are quite good okay so perhaps you have, you cannot go up because it's a memory bond perhaps it's okay but so it's an indicator, okay, so it's not uh, it's okay, or? I, I think such metrics should be explained. Yeah. Because um, in some cases people just assume that you could go higher and um, sometimes, most of the times, numerical methods, algorithms limit you. And so you, you, you You're right. not everything is possible. In fact, the, the two, right, the profile and this grade level are included in a energy report, mm -hmm. okay, 
And in this in the energy report, we explain how we uh, uh, calculate this uh, element. Symposium, um, and that's why I'm sure that's false, well, so I don't want to, to I don't, <laughs> I don't put any white paper or something, <laughs> so we we'll have that, uh, along with the, this, all the topics we, we addressed today, but I think it, this it makes some interesting inputs uh, for all of us, and I think for the today coming from the ADAC workshop, and we have many things to discuss, and many topics to address, so uh, I would like to thank again all the speakers for this day and the previous day. Thank you very much to participate to this today open symposium, and I hope you you learned some things and it was interesting for, for you. For myself, it was very interesting, and thank you very much for all of us. So when we uh, started organizing uh, ADAC 13, that is this one, that was decided at ADAC 12, and CEA uh, volunteered to be the host for this meeting. And uh, Franz gave a presentation that um, had a number of uh, new things in it that we could do. So one was to have this symposium open and for two days, and get different communities to talk about the the subject that we heard about, get different perspectives on, on these problems that we're all dealing with in these uh, large HPC centers and HPC applications. Um, we have a committee that organizes these, and so Rio is on it always, and Raluca is on it, and uh, Michele is on it, but we had actually very little to do. Most of the work was done by our hosts, and I'd like to uh, mention them. Uh, first of all, of course, France, uh, Boyot Seneur, stand up. <laughs> Christophe Calvin, also from <laughs> And then behind the scenes, all the registration and you know, the, the organization of the catering and the dealing with the hotel and everything. Uh, Katja Kastor. <laughs> and they really made this uh, a successful symposium. So, merci beaucoup. <laughs> okay, so it's closed. <laughs> Thank you very much.